This is the College of Complexes. We have with us tonight Andy L. D. Anderson, uh, the uh, Director of the Northwest Information Service of Palatine. Okay, let's give a warm welcome for Andy Anderson. Okay. Andy needs a baked potato. Okay, Andy. Good evening. Uh, my, everybody just calls me Andy. I am from uh, the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. My brother and I run the Northwest Information Service as a hobby, as a public service. And we I do presentations like this on a variety of subjects. And Tim is taping tonight. So, uh, because this is on tape, and in deference to people that might watch it on video later, what I'm going to ask you to do is we're going to be talking about a lot of different facts. And if, if you want, um, if you want a, uh, like a very solid reference source or something to where that fact is, where you can find it, you can take notes during the presentation. But I've got a bunch of books up here on, uh, you know, talking about different pieces of this. So, so just, you know, raise your hand real quick and say, where's the reference for that? And I'll just list the book and it'll go right into Tim's video and we'll just keep on going. That way we don't have to list, you know, 50 references at the very end uh, for people that might have a question. And well, dur all during the questions and answer period tonight, we'll do the same thing. We'll list references uh, because there's a bunch of facts that we're going to be talking about. Uh, hold on a minute. Let me... Possibly you could just pick up uh, some of the books and show the cover on the tape as well. Well, what we'll do is we'll put some links up on uh, on the uh, comment part of the uh, YouTube links. That that way they can link to them on the web. I think that's Hold on one sec. I see my outline for tonight's talk has been misplaced. So we'll just, what we'll do, hmm? it might be in my, talk among yourselves for about two minutes. I'll just run out of my car and start over there. Hold on. Oh, all right. Well, Andy is uh, going to out here. I believe what he's going to be telling us tonight is the uh, reasons why 9-11 need to be investigated. And I think it all starts with a lot of the uh, work done by the Project for the New American Century, followed by Bush and Cheney during up some corporate deals with the... Uh, Bush administration and some some problems with the insurance company to where Bush administration had special forces units put C4 explosives into the tower and then the tower was underwent a controlled demolition and that uh, he's going to be making the case for Bush to have war crimes put against him and why a lot of this stuff needs to be done this way. After the uh, and then he's also probably going to talk about how they struck a missile into the Pentagon versus the plane and uh, why the plane wreckage in uh, Pennsylvania is bogus. I don't believe any of this stuff myself, but uh, Andy's going to make his case tonight. I would request that everybody give him a good listen because Andy can and does produce a very good speech with a lot of good exculpatory evidence. I myself will hope to rebut him at the end of the night with a little bit of a rebuttal on what I've been doing. I myself have been looking into some of the stuff that Andy's been doing, and you know, particularly the biography of Loose Change. I've even gone back and read the 9-11 uh, Commission report. And if any of you really want or like thriller novels or the genre of a good 
High Core Mystery, I highly recommend that you read the first few chapters of the 9-11 Commission Report because it does read like a thriller novel. Let's re-welcome Andy Anderson. Did I hear Tim just talking about the 9-11 Commission Report? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Griffin, who has written 10 books on this subject, calls the 9-11 Commission Report a beautiful work of fiction. <laughs> 571 page lie. Uh, he read the report and after he got to 115 bald faced lies, falsehoods, whatever, he decided he had to write his own book called 9-11 Commission Report, Omissions and Distortions. And then after that he wrote the new Pearl Harbor. Some of those books are listed up here. Quick announcement. Uh, last week uh, we said that we would be uh, raffling off uh, some books, uh, whatever. Um, if anybody wants to uh, put put their name on a scrap of paper and uh, stick it in a cup, uh, we'll, we'll draw one name out of the hat and one person can pick out of this stack here. They're all classics on blacked out news of various kinds. Pick the book of your choice. There's one here called The Towers of Deception. It has a DVD in it, oh. uh, a nice DVD that you can play uh, that gives you the whole 9-11 deception story. The other books are about economics. There's one on censored news. Um, Ralph Nader's got a book in there on how uh, we can transform America, reorienting things. Uh, just uh, a whole bunch of books. Jesse Ventura's. Some of you may not know that Jesse Ventura put together a book called American Conspiracies from the Kennedy assassination on forward. It's excellent. Don't drink it though. So, uh, for everybody else, you can get one of those good books for $3, the same price as the College of Complexes. And whatever money we raise, we'll donate to a charity. So, for anybody that's interested in reading, uh, you can get peruse this book, uh, this stack here, while we're having questions and answers. And at the end, we'll uh, you know, hold the raffle. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm not a researcher per se. On my cards, it's, I'm listed as director of research. But basically, I'm a translator. I take the work of others, 5, 10, 15 books on a subject, and translate that mass into a one-page or a two-page, like cliff notes, like the literature reading here tonight. Uh, that golden, that uh, that paper, that golden paper. We made it on gold paper because uh, there's a there's this old saying. Well, that fact is as good as gold. You can take it to the bank. Yeah, you know, the the core of our talk tonight. We're going to start with one single fact that's agreed upon by all research analysts of what happened on 9-11. That is, the people that are doing honest research that aren't paid just to lie to us. If any of you are familiar with Ed Schultz, who has been on uh, MSNBC, he has a talk show. Ed's kind of like the opposite of Rush Limbaugh. Uh, he's in the, the progressive or left side of the fence. Ed just says, Rush Limbaugh and the others have told us, they've shown us how you win a debate. If, you're, if there's two people debating something, the way you want to debate is you just stand up there and lie your ass off. Just lie, bald-faced lies, one after another to make it sound like truth. That's what we got at, at the podium at the Lincoln three years ago when we supposedly had a debate on 9-11. I, I signed up to take one half of the debate. I thought we were going to debate what was unknown about 9-11. Well, the other person in the debate, I won't mention any names, just stood up here and lied to us for 90 minutes. And so that's why in America we have people... Charles Ferguson wrote a book called Predator Nation, and there's a chapter called The Ivory Tower. There's a group of about a thousand university professors in this, this book called Predator Nation. It's a chapter on the Ivory Tower. It describes the process where university professors are given a ton of money through the university and uh, endowments, uh, the Koch brothers, the chemical companies. <coughs> they pour money into a university and they, the professor will produce a report saying 
secondhand smoke is not harmful, or there's no such thing as global warming. Well, they can't say the Earth is flat anymore because we got pictures from the space shuttle. But it's basically flat Earth ignorance that these professors produce, and then they get up to a quarter of a million dollars to take their report and testify for an hour at Congress to enter it into the congressional record. And this is how bald-faced lies are presented as truth in America. The whole censor news, <coughs> Project Censor has been up and running for 37 years, and between 2006 and 2011, this book was loaded with articles talking about the various pieces of the fairy tale that the media sold us, supposedly being 9-11. Now, the researchers all over the world have been referring to it as a well-produced fairy tale now for over a decade. There's no debate anymore about what happened in New York. The debate is when we're going to go after the people that did it. But, once, as I've said many times, 30 years ago you could get into a fist fight in a restaurant if you asked somebody to put out their cigarette or their cigar smoking next to you. Today, uh, smoke-free restaurants are an idea whose time is coming. Last week we had a speaker yeah, for those of you that try to put together a rebuttal in three or four minutes, you can appreciate how hard it is to summarize something when uh, you didn't have a piece of information at your fingertips. I thought about it a couple of things later. But the people that were here, uh, raise your hands. You know, did you get the impression that our speaker last week was talking about the benefits of Ayn Rand's philosophy, that if we just tried lazy fair capitalism, it would, it would help improve our country? Was, does, was I the only one that got that message, or was that the gist of it? That was the gist of it. That was the gist of it. Well, I brought a book with me tonight. It's here somewhere. It's written by a It's Paul, Paul Craig Roberts. Uh, it's, it's 2013. It's called The Failure of Laissez-Faire Capitalism. And he summarizes, and basically, Maybe the people in the room, I, I, thought, I thought to myself, um, the only way you could promote that is if you were in solitary confinement in prison for the last decade and you didn't live through the Bush administration. The Bush administration was Ayn Rand's wet dream. Let the billionaires run wild. So the market will take care of it. There's a poster up here, how this works. Those are CEOs from the oil companies. They're testifying before Congress. The CEOs of some major oil companies are testifying before Congress. They have nothing to do with setting prices for oil and gasoline. The market does it, just like the market ferry. <laughs> with a straight face, with their hand up under oath, they're testifying, we have nothing to do with the prices Americans are paying for oil. Now, I had another poster that I, w I couldn't find it. It would look like that. I thought that was it. It's the tobacco industry, the, the seven people standing there, CEOs, under oath with their hand up in front of the Senate saying, we have no evidence that nicotine is addictive. We don't know what all the fuss is about. This was 1994, after they were getting buried under billions of dollars worth of lawsuits. This is how mythology is promoted in America. You promote the myth on all channels, and simultaneously, you run a coordinated blackout. It's like, you'll, you'll hear me refer to a, a group called Albert and his friends. It's, it's like, I thought to myself, what if we had a group like Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends from the physics department that would send a letter to the president saying, Mr. President, we'd appreciate it if you stopped saying the earth is flat. We got pictures from the space shuttle. What are you going to do with Albert and his friends? Uh, a group like that of people that have 10, 20, 30 years experience, and there's hundreds of them with Nobel Prize credentials, producing the forensic evidence on key issues. You had Albert and his friends produce the evidence on tobacco, on asbestos, and the, the database, this is what's known as a database. You know, hundreds of scientists working on it, publishing books, reports. After a while, the database gets so big that you can't any longer deny it with a straight face. You have to start settling out of court. Well, today, uh, I attended, I don't know if any of you did, I attended a memorial service, two of them, in Palatine, on 9-11. Uh, the first one was firefighters out there at the firefighter memorial near the train tracks. It was a nice service and everything. 
And then uh, they all went to St. St. Thomas's uh, church, and there's a school, K through six, right next to a Catholic school near that church. And in the presentation of the church, it was a nice memorial service honoring the people that died. And they had fifth graders coming up with little pieces of paper like this, cards with their uh, comments written on it. I, I talked to the teacher later, and she says, oh yeah, the fifth graders, we, they've been studying all the pieces of 9-11 for the last two weeks. They're in their fourth and fifth grade. They're indoctrinating these kids down there in fourth and fifth grade with the fairy tale of 9-11. There was 19 crazed Muslims that defeated the entire United States military in two hours. And so I'm, I'm going to put together a, a fact sheet and go over to that school, you know, a couple months when things die down and say, if you're going to teach kids facts, you got to get the facts right. You can't be teaching them correct information because they, when they find out you were lying to them, when they get a little older, they're going to have a distrust of the whole educational system when they find out you fed them one bald-faced lie after another. But apparently in the adult population now, we have a lot of people that are immune to facts. They just go along believing the fairy tale uh, long after the facts have been published, and that's where we are on 9-11. We're still, we're, this is the 13th anniversary. And for, I've been wrestling with this question for, you know, 15, 20 years. The last few years especially. What do you do, what do you say to a person who's got a college degree, they got a good job, they're very intelligent, they got a nice, nice job, and they're standing in a blizzard of evidence on a subject, and they claim they can't see a single snowflake. Do, do people just keep ignoring the evidence. Well, it's okay to ignore the evidence. You know, if you don't want to study uh, the latest ongoing episodes of the Kardashian family, that's okay. You can believe anything you want. But uh, when our grandsons, sons, and daughters are dying in the radioactive wasteland of Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're instructing young people in high school, you, you don't want to be Miss America, you want to be a Marine and get in the military and go overseas and make big bucks without telling them that they're going to be uh, living in like an uh, area, something like the cloud of Chernobyl. Downwind of Chernobyl, that's what it's like in Iraq and Afghanistan from all the radioactive dust dispersal weapons. Those two countries in Kosovo have been considered uninhabitable for humans since 2005. <laughs> You get, or you get outside the United States around the world and they know about depleted uranium dust. The bunker buster bombs, armor piercing tank shells that uh, are used as personnel elimination weapons. They have armor piercing tank shells that don't have depleted uranium in them. But the big beauty is with the ones with the heavy dense uranium, it's called depleted uranium, it's left over from the mining and the nuclear power industry. When those shells explode, billions of tiny uh, radioactive particles of dust go into the air and they, they lodge in your lungs and bones. So that um, all of the, a lot of the veterans of the first Gulf War in 1991, a lot of them have already died and the rest are on their way to dying of various illnesses caused by radiation. And uh, the Vietnam veterans had something called Agent Orange. The modern veterans have depleted uranium. And it's, uh, we think depleted uranium is a way bigger scandal than Agent Orange. But they're not talking about it. Because if you talk about these kinds of things, people will say, well, oh, we, we have to keep fighting the terrorists over there because 9-11, 9-11, 9-11. Well, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. It's easy. Professor Griffin, in, in his book, um, first book he wrote, he said it, it's very easy to understand the evidence on 9-11. You don't need an open mind. You need a 30% open mind. The hard part, the hard part is stepping through the psychological barrier. Stepping through the barrier and looking at the evidence. The reason, the reason the media don't want you to step through the barrier is the evidence is so easy to understand that a seventh grader can grasp it. Like, Like it says on that 
we'll do a couple of little demonstrations here real quick. Uh, the forensic evidence, the one that uh, says forensic evidence update on 9-11, the, the single fact you start with, you start with that one fact that the two twin towers went sideways in the wind as a cloud of dust. Sideways in the wind. They, they did not fall to the ground from the effects of fire or the plane crash or anything else. Part of, the, part of the myth of the day, the reason they had two plane crashes in Manhattan was that they would start, yeah, it's like the, the plane crashes were the magician's smoke and mirrors to get some smoke started in the building so that all the cameras from the media that were prepared and trained on the buildings, they're all pointing to, pointing to the smoke and say, oh yeah, look at those fires up there. And then when the when the explosives were triggered, the fire, I, I imagine a lot of firefighters said to themselves, "Whoops, we're going to heaven." And then a half a second later, they were vaporized because they, you know, they knew they were a you know, controlled demolition explosion. The two twin towers were different. They were there were three. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there were three towers that came down. There were just two. There were three big towers that were demolished in New York, and those are the only three buildings, incidentally, that have ever been brought down by fire. Steel frame buildings. Some of you may have may have seen this demonstration, or a, a, a fraction of it. This is a torch. This is a torch we use uh, for soldering copper pipe. It, it uses propane or butane, but this is a steel screwdriver right out of my um, right out of my toolbox. And you can see that metal's not even getting red hot yet. It, you might be able to get a sort of reddish, but with butane, propane, kerosene, everybody see that? Uh, that steel screwdriver, it's not cast iron now, it's steel. It's the same kind of, you know, a steel that was certified at the Trade Center to withstand 2,000 degrees for six hours before it would uh, sag or deform in any way, shape, or form. And you notice, I'm holding on to this screwdriver with my bare hand down here at the end. The, end, the tip of that's not melting, it's not getting red hot, it's right there in the flame. This kind of flame is a little bit hotter than burning uh, JP, you know, kerosene jet fuel in flames. Steel doesn't melt in hydrocarbon flames. If you log on to any of the 9-11 sites, they will show you pictures, pictures of hotels. I think there was one in Spain, it might have been Madrid, I forget all the places. They, they've had raging high-rise fires and high raging, raging fires in hotels, steel frame hotels, where the building is just gutted, absolutely gutted, and then when the fire goes out, finally put it out, they can just redo the plaster in the walls, the floors, the, the steel is untouched and undamaged by the fire. That's the first big myth they sold us on the myth of 9-11. Well, the steel just melted and boom, buildings fell down. The second big myth, of course, is fact number one, that there's no debate on that. See, there, there is, if you do the research on 9-11, you will find a bunch of pictures. There's a bunch of pictures showing what what they call ground zero, what it looked like after the two twin towers have been demolished. For those of you that are interested in actually uh, reading a good book on this, you can order a book online. The, um, Thank you. I promise you, I'm going to bring the picture. Yeah, you know, Gene, Gene gave us a good comment uh, three or four years ago when he looked at that picture. Remember that, Gene? You, you looked at that picture of the big cloud, and uh, after the other fellow was telling us that that was a building collapsing from fire, and Gene says, "Give my ass a break." <laughs> Remember that? That's a building being blown to dust. Medium. When. 
when material goes up and out, a big cloud of dust forms, that's not a building collapsing. That's a building being pulverized. This book uh, is called Where Do the Towers Go? It's a physics textbook with a, a bunch of pictures in it showing what happened, the forensic evidence. She, ma she makes no claim about who was responsible for 9-11. Her interest is just what's the forensic evidence show? What, what does it show happen? And you start with the fact that there's virtually no rubble pile on the ground where the two twin towers used to be. <laughs> the, I'm surprised that none of the papers have been talking about the firefighters, thousands of them nationwide that are in or allied with a group called Firefighters for 9-11 Truth. They, they produced a DVD, a video with the firefighters' testimony, the survivors that got back to the stations on the night of 9-11, they're all sitting around there talking about witnessing the layers of explosions going off as the, all three buildings were brought down, you know, by controlled demolition. But uh, one, one firefighter said, when you can look through the rubble pile where it should have been, when a building collapses and there's nothing there, you know something bad happened in the air. The two twin towers were pre-packed, as the picture on this cover shows, the, the dust cloud went up and out and rolled out as uh, the towers were converted to hundreds of thousands of tons of fine microscopic powdery dust. Now there were some particles that were bigger than microscopic, but there was a lot of microscopic dust there. They were dustified. In 2005, the physicists for 9-11 put out a, a news a news release. Uh, they sent it to all the major media. They said this is 2005. We can state with certainty now after looking at the evidence that the events of the day involved aircraft substitution and controlled demolition. The four planes that we told were crashed weren't the four planes that actually crashed. The four planes that took off with passengers went somewhere else. And the two, the, the two tail numbers that were supposed to have crashed in the Twin Towers, those two, those two tail numbers were in service in 2005, still ferrying passengers. They weren't involved in the crashes. Other uh, big military type planes were repainted and used uh, on autopilot. The pilots for 9-11 Truth think that the two planes that hit the towers were military drones that were empty and they were flown on very, very accurate military GPS. They've been bragging for, since 1984, they've been bragging about being able to program a cruise missile to fly on the accurate military GPS. They can, we can program a cruise missile to fly through the front door of a building 200 miles away. And it'll follow, you know, the, the GPS signals. And that kind of GPS was uh, put into a lot of military planes, and there were some they were trying it out as anti-hijacking gear in commercial airliners in the late 90s so that they could just shut off the pilot's controls and send a signal to the autopilot in the plane and it would just go to the nearest airfield and the pilot sitting up there in the chairs had absolutely no control over the plane itself. That technology has been around since the late 90s. So if you're interested, there, there's uh, the group called Pilots for 9-11 Truth. It might be a .org, uh, it's, it's, but it's Pilots for 9-11 Truth. They have a set of DVDs you can buy. Uh, they have tracked the radar tracings and the signals of where the, the four flights that took off on 9-11, uh, they were sending signals to towers and they were still in flight uh, long after we were told they crashed. And they, they weren't even near the major crash sites. Um, there are all kinds of survivors of the bombings at the Pentagon. The Pentagon was initially bombed and then something small and fast moving flew into the side to make the hole. And um, the media sold us the myth that 19 guys that couldn't hardly fly Piper Cubs were able to fly these big computer controlled jets and hit with perfect accuracy. You might log on to the Pilots for 9-11 Truth site because they give you the, um, the instruction manuals, uh, you know, what, what pilots need to know to fly a big jumbo jet. And the first thing, in order to get your pilot's license and, you know, get certified and everything else, they teach you, you can't, you can't exceed the, 
the stress, uh, the, the, the stress, the structural ratings of an aircraft frame. That is, if uh, if you're if you if you dive an aircraft down, if you're going 500 miles an hour and you dive down near the ground and you get into dense air, it will rip the wings off. As you're coming in for a landing, you have to slow the plane down. They, there's been several cases they talk about of airliners that exceeded the uh, the stress ratings of the airframe and where they were in a dive, and as they got down into dense air, the aircraft ripped apart. Some of them barely made a landing with all kinds of damage, others just crashed. But they said that the pilots for 9-11 Truth and the Top Gun pilots, they said it's, it's flat out impossible to fly a big plane that close to the ground, skimming over the lawn, and hit, make the small hole 16 feet in diameter of the Pentagon. So they, the, the pilots knew on the afternoon of 9-11 that the idea of the big airliner was flying that fast, skimming along the grass without hitting the grass. They said that actually the engines would have been dragging in the grass if they had, the plane had actually hit the nose of where they pointed to the hole. But it took a French author, his name is Thierry Meissen. The Frenchman published the first picture that anybody had ever seen. It was a year later, two years later, I don't know where he found it uh, from an internet site, but it's an iconic picture of the Pentagon. It shows the small hole where they told us the plane went in, but this is taken right after the explosion there. There's still fire and everything, but the, ups, uh, the roof line, the roof line of the Pentagon and the windows, the, the rows of windows on both sides and above the hole were unbroken. So something small without any big wings of any kind flew into the side of the Pentagon and made that hole. And, and, but a, a day later, uh, they were out there with big trucks uh, putting gravel all over the lawn uh, so that uh, they, they covered up the forensic evidence as fast as they could. If you, you can log on to the sites, you'll see a whole line of people. Uh, they might be FBI people or Pentagon people, guys in suits and ties. They're, they look like... Um, like those pictures you see of guys that are uh, arm to arm searching through the woods for any scrap of a disappeared child. Well, they're arm to arm, a whole line of them going across the Pentagon lawn and picking up little pieces of what looked like confetti or whatever they would say. Whatever it was that hit the wall disintegrated, and they were picking up the pieces of it so that there wouldn't be anything left. And also, you know, the Pentagon they, there is rumored to have 85 good cameras looking at all the different angles. You can't approach the Pentagon in an aircraft without risking getting shot down by their anti-aircraft batteries on the roof. The, uh, the pen in the White House is protected also. So the other thing about the Pentagon that you might find interesting is that the terrorists hit the one spot in the Pentagon where it wouldn't cause any reasonable, unreasonable damage. That one wing had just been refurbished in the walls, the walls on each side of where the hole was, had been reinforced with uh, Kevlar netting and everything to make that area blast resistant and with blast resistant glass on the sides so that it could handle a blast without any major damage to the rest of the Pentagon. These are little tidbits that have just gone down the memory hole uh, because mainstream media said, oh well, 19 Arabs got lucky with box cutters that day. If all of you have that piece of literature, uh, the third one. Pardon the interruption. Uh, <clears throat> I, I dug these out of the archives. And we printed up a bunch of these things for presentation starting in 2008. This one came off the website called 911truth.org. It was the, the first, a really highly credible 911 website. And that's the one that says 911 is the key to political transformation. And it gives you a whole list of things in there that could be solved with the trillion dollars a year we're pouring down the military rat hole driven by the myth of 911. This other flyer, this four-page flyer, uh, is a summary. This is a summary of probably 50 or 100 books. John Comiskey put it together. It's called 9-11 Was a Hoax. And in that, that uh, it, it, this issue, he points out that 
Our country, our country is the only country in the world that had, that we were told, had efficient, highly efficient intelligence operations that thought America was attack, attacked by 19 crazed Muslims. N intelligence agencies like our NSA or FBI, CIA, intelligence agencies all over the world, all over the world, knew the rest of the 95% of the people, their countries knew that 9-11 was an inside job, that Osama didn't do it. They knew that on the 9-11. The fellow from Germany, uh, the head of the German intelligence said, look at how beautifully they sold that hoax to the American people. That required months or years of planning, and it required having people inside, insiders that knew the role they were supposed to play that day. You had insiders playing the key role. If any one of these people stepped out of line and didn't play their proper role, the whole house of cards, the myth would have come tumbling down in a heartbeat. You had people at the air traffic controllers, you had people in the Secret Service guarding Bush, people uh, that were surrounded chain. Yes, Rumsfeld was in on it, obviously. Cheney was one of the, Cheney and Rumsfeld appeared to be two of the major coordinators of 9-11. There's a book here called Another 19 in this stack. It's written by Kevin Ryan, I believe it is. Yeah, it's Kevin. Uh, I confuse uh, Kevin Barrett and Kevin Ryan are two different researchers. I think Kevin Ryan was the one uh, that was worked at, um, what do you call it, Underwriters Laboratory. He worked uh, at Underwriters Lab and he sent a letter to the government asking for clarification because he had been involved and his friends had been involved, co-workers, with Underwriters Laboratory certified the steel, big steel girders that weigh hundreds of tons, they certified that steel for withstand 2,000 degrees for like, you know, six hours without any problem at all. So he read, he sent a letter to the National Institute of, you know, Standards, so the government the NIST that put out the report, he said, could you please tell me the calculations you used to show how the steel was melted with lower burning fires from kerosene from jet fuel? and also office fires. There was black smoke coming out. He said, when you see black smoke, you know it's, it's not a hot burning fire. And uh, his letter, when he requested that from the Bush government, he got fired by the underwriter's laboratory. It cost him his job. And so uh, the same thing a few months later, people had started to ask, uh, that were involved in the, the anthrax investigation, biologists that had experience working with anthrax like that in the laboratories, they started having mysterious accidents. Anybody that uh, had the ability to speak out, they were, uh, a couple dozen of them, had mysterious deaths before they even had time to speak out because after 9-11 happened, after 9-11 happened, they had the Patriot Act. Does everybody here know what the Patriot Act is basically? Uh, this is not anything new to anybody here. The, the laws that were passed by Congress in October of 01 to give us homeland security, right? And, and turn America into a virtual police state. Well, the Patriot Act apparently had been prepared two, three, four years in advance. Nobody knows. They, they wanted to have it ready when a catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor happened, and then they could bulldoze it through Congress. Well, there are congressmen now that are speaking out because they're not, they're not afraid of getting killed now like Paul Wellstone was. They're saying the Patriot Act was passed because there were no, Congress wasn't given any printed copies to read it. They printed it for the congressmen and their staff after they passed it into law, voted for it. The Patriot Act was passed totally blind without the average congressman knowing anything about it. Dick Cheney just dumped it on Congress and passed this. The two senators, uh, Senator Leahy and Senator Daschle, I think it was, Tom Daschle, uh, uh, Pat Leahy. Anyway, those two senators were the two that were on the committees that they said, well, we want to read the Patriot Act before we pass it. Boom. They get anthrax letters in the mail a couple of days later. And some postal workers died. You guys, some of you people are old enough to remember the anthrax scare, right? 
we didn't want to open our mail until somebody said, you know, a couple people are nodding their heads like they remember what that, that, that scare was like. And I, I wondered about my own mail. And then it turned out that the anthrax wasn't just willy-nilly sent out in the American mail as a terrorist event. Members of Congress that were holding up the Patriot Act were targeted with the anthrax attacks. And when it became, they had a short investigation when the strain of anthrax was traced to, uh, it was the Ames, Iowa strain, but they were working on it in Fort Detricks. They proved conclusively that the anthrax came from an American military lab. It didn't come from at one of our bioweapons labs. It didn't come from a cave in Afghanistan. That was it for the anthrax investigation. That just stopped, and we don't hear a peep about it anymore. Uh, so I, I was, you know, this week I was thinking about our speech last week. Um, we lived through six years of billionaires running wild, being unopposed by anybody in authority, law. Our country was run by criminals, run, just flat out run wild for six solid years because of the new Pearl Harbor that gave us Homeland Security, 9-11. Now, understanding what happened on 9-11 is the key to getting our country back from the billionaire criminals that were and currently are running it. For those of you that may not be aware, President Obama is running the 14th year of the Bush-Cheney crimes. Obama was the first president that I'm aware of when, when the changed parties, that is to say, when president, we voted the criminals out in 2008. A lot of Republicans, independents, there was a nationwide consensus. Many, many Republicans crossed over and says, these people running our country aren't Republicans, they're criminals, and we want them out. We don't want another four years of Republican crime spree, so they voted for the Democratic candidate who happened to be Obama. It could have been anybody. Uh, you know, the Democratic dog catcher from uh, Rolling Meadows could have been running for president, and they would have voted him in. John Ashcroft, you may, may recall that uh, the, the original John Ashcroft was one of the early people that took over the Bush administration. John Ashcroft became our attorney general. Does anybody remember him? Have a show of hands. Yeah. Well, John Ashcroft lost his election to a dead man that died three weeks or four weeks earlier, and the people still voted for the dead guy over John Ashcroft. That's how unpopular he was, that people knew who he was. And so a lot of people that were politically disgraced, a lot, a lot of people that had uh, indictments, had gotten out of prison or were pardoned by uh, President Bush, a whole bunch of these people that had criminal backgrounds, they all coalesced into the Bush-Cheney administration right after they got control of the White House. And as we say, you know, for those of you that aren't aware, George Bush was never the president. He was a corporate criminal masquerading as a president after he was illegally installed in that chair in the Oval Office by massive criminal activity, treasonous activity. There's a poster up here that's called Misprision of Treason. That's a legal term. It means if some law enforcement officer or a politician and it took an oath to uphold the law, if they are willfully ignoring evidence of a crime in front of them, they can be prosecuted for obstruction of justice. Now, when have we seen anybody in this country prosecuted for obstruction of justice for looking the other way during the eight years of the Bush-Cheney crime spree? Not a one. And President Obama, the first thing he did, he said, oh, we're not going to prosecute anybody. We're prosecuting anybody. We're going to move forward. First thing he said, more or less, when he got in the old office, said, we, we got to look forward. we got to look forward. We can't talk about anything in the past. And, to finish my thought, there's about 2,000 career, you know, uh, politicians, not politicians like in Congress, they're, they're career civil servants, in other words. People, the Democratic Party will promote a bunch of them, and they take all the 2,000 of the top jobs in Washington. Then when the Republicans get in, well, all those people get pink slips, and the Republicans appoint their own people. That's how it's always been when parties change hands, right? Does everybody, anybody here aware of that? Does that sound uh, familiar to some of you? Well, are you aware that the 
When Bush left, President Obama didn't clean house. He allowed all those criminals to become embedded as permanent employees. So we, we, we basically don't have Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice, Bush, the, the real figureheads, but the people doing the dirty work, running the government, are, are the same, basically, as uh, the whole Republican criminal enterprise, you know, masquerading as Republicans. I call them criminals masquerading as Republicans. Because you know, a lot of Republicans have said, well, <laughs> these people aren't Republicans, they're criminals. And, There's a book up here somewhere, I thought I brought it, but it's called, uh, It's Worse Than You Think. It's a whole book talking about, the, we have a myth, the mainstream media promotes a myth today that, well, all politicians lie to us, they're, they're the same on both sides. And the title of that book is, It's Worse Than You Think. They're not all lying to us, the Republicans are the problem. The Republican Party has been taken over by career corporate criminals whose job it is to lie to us. They're not Republicans in any sense of going back 40, 50 years. It's, it's a totally different America. And until we address the driving myth, what, what he calls the source of their dark force, it's like the Energizer Bunny that never runs down. They, you know, the, the driving force that gives energy to all these kinds of things is the myth of 9-11. And we puncture that bubble then what, what happens if we puncture the bubble of 9-11? Well, the first thing you find out is that our troops aren't fighting for freedom and justice in foreign lands. They're murdering women and children and moving off the spaces where they want to build a new pipeline across Afghanistan or the oil fields in Iraq or wherever they have other resources. General. You all ought to have a copy of this book and share it with your kids and grandkids. It's called War is a Racket. General Smedley Butler blew a whistle on these people in 1935. And this has been reprinted up in 2005. It's a little book, you know, you can get it anywhere. War is a Racket. Butler said he was the most decorated Marine general. When he retired, he said he, he began to get a better, different perspective on what he was doing. And he said, we weren't defending freedom and justice. We weren't fighting for American values. We, we were, he said, I was muscle for the mob. United Fruit Company, Standard Oil. Uh, the military, U.S. military, has been a protection for big corporations ever since 1935. With the exception of World War II, where a really evil empire was defeated, uh, pretty much everybody agrees on that, most of it. But after Vietnam, even Vietnam, uh, Jesse Ventura's book talks about the seeds of 9-11 were planted in 1963 when they got rid of Kennedy. They said, we want to move the country in a direction toward a permanent war economy. So many of you have heard me say many times, if I live long enough for time travel to become possible, the first place I'm going is back to find George Orwell and shake his hand and say, our media has exceeded your wildest expectations. <laughs> There's no question about it. Orwell, would, he would just be amazed. He says, yeah, that's what I told you Big Brother would look like. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is what we have in America today. You get outside the United States, and you'd be amazed at what's being reported by the media, independent media all over the world. And right now, the Internet is still free and open. You can access a lot of good stuff on the Internet, but if they have their way... <coughs> Uh, the internet is going to become, going to become uh, privatized by the big corporations. So there's a huge internet fight. You can log on to uh, Common Dreams, BuzzFlash, uh, many of the the, the uh, truth out. I have cards up here with those websites. Um, anybody wants a, a list of those portal websites that I check every day, every other day, uh, pick one of these cards up before you leave. But um, I'm, I was just made aware recently that the military, uh, our, our trillion dollar a year military budget, is donating 
some used equipment, but a lot of new equipment. These uh, military uh, armored uh, armored personnel carriers, uh, mine resistant. Uh, you know, they look like almost small tanks. They're called MRAPs. Uh, all kinds of uh, high am high quality ammunition, machine guns. This stuff is being donated by our Pentagon to little towns all over the country. You know, the, the American, you know, what happened in Ferguson? With the, where they just go, they're they're practicing gunning down people to see what they can get away with before the American public finally rebels, and uh, they're conditioning us to get used to a police state. They're conditioning us to get used to uh, people being shot by the police for looking suspicious. You know, they, uh, a lot of people talk about. I didn't really realize this when I was growing up, but African American people know that there's. There's tickets you can get. You can get a ticket while involved in the activity of driving while black. It doesn't matter that you didn't violate any law. They just pull you over and give you a ticket. And now they're killing people. Same thing. They're, they're grabbing people off the street in New York under the new Homeland Security rules. Um, the Homeland Security rules that are contained in the Patriot Act, uh, it spells it out. Any person that's suspected of anything can just be picked up by the Homeland Security Police, flown to a secret prison, no phone call, no lawyer, you disappear and your family won't know where you are. Now that's not happening to mainstream, what we call mainstream Americans, in big enough numbers yet for anybody to raise a ruckus. And the media, uh, other than we wouldn't have known how bad this has gotten if the media had not been forced to cover the assassination in broad daylight of that unarmed boy in Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Ferguson, Missouri. There's there's so many of these things happening. You know, they say, well, that's not unusual. That's happening all over the country. They said uh, roughly 5,000 Americans have been murdered by the police. Most of them unarmed. Over 5,000 Americans have been murdered since 9/11. <laughs> Yeah, uh, what? Uh, let us in on a joke, Charlie. Uh, what? Picking on these cops. Here. What? Picking on the cops. Here. Well, if we have retired cops in the room, <laughs> I the it's message to them is: I say you got out while the getting was good. If you're done. If you were if you were a policeman 30 years ago, you were in a different kind of mentality and police force than what we have now. Am I right? Does anybody raise their hand? Is there, are the police force different than they were 30 years ago? Yeah. Okay, now, I'm not picking on uh, police that think it's their job to serve and protect. I'm talking about the police that are wearing the flak jackets and the armor and driving around these armored vehicles and everything, considering the public as enemy number one rather than serve and protect. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Everybody okay here? Yes. Nobody's choking on anything? No. <laughs> well, I'll uh, close with a few. I've gone through this presentation uh, different. I've you know, rewritten it. You know, my final cut was literally the back of an envelope. <laughs> that's, that's why I've been working on this for the last uh, you know day and a half, thinking leave this out, leave that out. You know, everybody complains. Well. I've heard that before, I don't want to hear that again. You want to hear something new? It's like trying to cram 50 pounds of apples into a 20 pound bag. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, there's so much evidence. You can do that. On the back of that, that golden paper, there's a, uh, a forensic evidence that says part two, update. You, you can just look at briefly, uh, you know, those, those are facts that are backed by a large body of data that was solid when this was printed in 2009, five years ago. This, uh, this, what's on this page now represents the tip of the iceberg that has emerged and published all over the world. There is no, there's no debate on the fact that three towers came down. There's no debate on the fact that the two twin towers were dustified. They went sideways in the wind as a cloud of dust. There's no debate on the fact that no big airliner crashed at the Pentagon. There's no debate on the fact that 
uh, Flight 93 did not crash in that hole in Pennsylvania where they said it crashed. Flight 93 went somewhere else. Some other plane was shot down and wreckage was scattered over eight miles. That may or may not have been 93, but it didn't crash in the hole that the media had been prepared to show us where the heroic people flew it into the ground. That's all part of a media media-driven fairy tale that was produced. Uh, one book says the, 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 the planning for 9-11, New Pearl Harbor, began in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. They needed a new big enemy, a new boogeyman to keep motivating Americans to support the trillion dollars a year that goes down the military rat hole to 800 bases around the world. If we weren't constantly at war with terrorists, then uh, why do we have to spend all that money rather than spending it on colleges, health care, uh, a myriad of things? Our, uh, Professor uh, David Michael Green wrote an article uh, a few years back. It was called One Number. He said, just memorize this number, $1 trillion a year. He said, we have 5% of the world's people. We spend a $1 trillion a year on the military. If we don't change that, it is going to totally eliminate the middle class altogether. We'll have a, have a few hundred thousand rich people and a few dozen billion or trillionaires, and then a massive amount, hundreds of millions of people living in poverty in this country. He wrote that about six years ago, and that is where we are today. There's a new book coming out uh, on economics. It's called David DeGraw is the author. It's supposed to be printed on the 17th of September released then anyway, it's called The Economics of Revolution. And he talks, he's an economist, but he, he's, he's summarized books like what we got here on the economy, and he said for the last 40 years, the American media and the American government have been lying to us about the American economy and the job situation. He said there's 213 million adult working uh, people that could have a full-time job in America. 213 million adults working age, there's 106 million full-time jobs. The rest, half of this country, is unemployed or underemployed or struggling along with two or three jobs that pay homeless shelter wages. We have people working full-time living in homeless shelters in this country. And this is all driven by the idea that was proposed last week that we shovel money to billionaires and let them run wild, and that we pour a trillion dollars a year down the military rat hole to fight four or five terrorists in this town over there on the other side of the world. Incidentally, if you've been watching the news, has anybody heard this name ISIS or ISIL? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. ISIS is the new, that was one of my quotes here. I, ISIS is, is designed to take the place of Al-Qaeda. The myth of Al-Qaeda is now well known. The myth of Al-Qaeda has been exposed for what it is, that Al-Qaeda was a handful of uh, people that were initially funded and trained by our CIA to do our dirty work in these other countries. And there's an old proverb, I, I don't know where it comes from, but it says, uh, I thought I read it in one of the book of Chinese proverbs. It says, when you're riding a dead horse, you've got to get up and change horses. Well, uh, where does that come from? Anybody know where that quote comes from? Or, or, or is it just... Yeah, well, I know it's an old Chinese proverb that says, you know, if you keep going in the direction you're going, you're going to end up where you're going eventually. It's hard. It's very difficult to wake up a man who is pretending to be asleep. We have people that are pretending to be asleep. That can't see, uh, they're standing in a blizzard of facts, can't see a single snowflake. So, for those of you that are interested in what's going on in America, I would highly recommend the latest edition of David Ray Griffin's book, uh, The New Pearl Harbor Revisited, um, Naomi Klein's new book. For those of you that read The Shock Doctrine and thought it was good, uh, her new book is going to be released next Tuesday. I think, what is that, the 15th, 16th? Um, this coming week. Her new book is called This Changes Everything. And she says that the climate crisis, the climate change crisis is the biggest opportunity we've had ever 
to change our broken economic system. And uh, she said basically, and several others have said the same thing, capitalism itself is at war with the planet. And so, uh, as in, and again, I brought these two examples to show well, there's a video on one of the 9-11 sites. Uh, I saw it after I, I used this uh, a week ago. You can talk about facts as oranges. You can talk about a bunch of facts, and then somebody will get up and say, why have you been talking about bananas all night? It just, you know, we, you can't see what's right in front of your face. People will resist, people resist change if the information is so, uh, so terrifying that they can't believe that it's happening around them. But things get better, like these, all of these authors are saying, puncture the myth of 9-11 and let's do something constructive with that trillion dollars a year. A whole bunch of things can get better in America when people wake up and say, hey, we were lied to about 9-11. And uh, there, there's no reason for us. The other thing, give me two, oh, never mind, I'll do the, I'll do the demonstration while we're answering questions and answers. Um, just open the, start asking, uh, answer questions. All right, okay. you have the first question. All right, Andy, in his brief, All right, let's, let's, let's yeah. Andy. As briefly as possible, can you give us a quick summary of the events of 9-11? Oh, okay. A brief 60-second summary of the events of 9-11. There was a group of people, rich people, that had some old office buildings. They were losing money, filled with asbestos. That's the World Trade Center. They, uh, since 1989, those buildings were scheduled for demolition. Well, we're going to blow up the site in 10 or 11 years and build something else on it anyway that's more profitable. They couldn't figure out how to do that without being sued for spreading asbestos dust all over lower Manhattan. So they waited and waited. And in 1993, they arranged for somebody to bomb one of the World Trade Centers. Not enough to really damage it, but enough to get a new security protocol. So the uh, cousin of George Bush with his company took over the security of the trade centers. And then from 1994-95 on, they started doing the preparations for the destruction of the trade center, not just the Twin Towers. All those buildings were devastated. So they waited, and when the Bush administration came along, and see these friends, these guys are friends, uh, bridge playing buddies or uh, yacht, yachting uh, partners, they said, well, we're, we're going to take over the White House in 2000, and we need a new Pearl Harbor to motivate Congress to support the takeover of Iraq and Afghanistan and, and Syria and where, where there's oil fields. We want to permanently move the country in that direction, but the Congress will never go for it unless they're motivated by a new Pearl Harbor. So the people that own the trade center said, well, uh, why don't we fly a couple of drones into the buildings and we'll call it an attack by 19 crazed Muslims, because that's where you want to invade where the oil fields are. Incidentally, this is, this is important. It, uh, it, it's free at the libraries. It's a movie called Avatar. For those of you that have never seen this, it's a multi-billion dollar, one of the best movies that ever came out of Hollywood that describes exactly what our military has been doing in Iraq and Afghanistan and everywhere else. The, the Marine that uh, changed sides in this movie, he said, you find out where the resources are, you find out who's living over that land, and if they won't give up their resources for a little beads and chalk, you send in the Marines to wipe them out. That's what our military is doing all over the world, and it's described brilliantly in this two, two and two hour, two hour, 20 minute movie called Avatar. If you don't have time to read the last hundred books on the military-industrial complex in America, you can check this out from the library or buy it for twenty bucks, twenty-five dollars, at any video store. But after they answer Tim's question, after the event, then they dumped the Patriot Act on Congress because that was already prepared. For those of you that didn't know, the soldiers that invaded Afghanistan were getting their shots and packing their bags and everything, getting all their gear ready back in June several months before 9-11 even happened. 
As soon as Bush Cheney took over the White House, they started planning for the invasion of Afghanistan in October, and high-ranking people in Turkey and others were notified, don't get alarmed because our troops are going to be coming, but we're not going to attack you. We're just building a new pipeline across Afghanistan. So it's going to be called hunting for terrorists. But the only place they were hunting for Osama was right across that new pipeline route in Afghanistan. Yes, Prada. Uh, in the Pentagon, why limit it to one section? Why not blow up the whole Pentagon? Oh, the question, that's a good question. Why, why limit, it, why limit uh, the damage to just one section? <coughs> well, they didn't want to blow up the whole Pentagon and kill any more people than they had. You know, all, all the high-ranking officials in the Pentagon, nobody was killed. They were on the other side. You know, the, the, uh, the, the, the internal bombs were planted in the Pentagon. There were several of them that went off a minute or two before whatever flew into the side is shown on the cameras. That's why they've never released any film that shows what flew into the side of the Pentagon, because it would be game over. If they release film on any of this stuff, people start asking, well, if that's not true, you know, what else isn't true? You know, there, uh, there's a term called fraud negates everything else. You know, if you have a testimony of a, you know, if a testimony of an eyewitness is lying to you, then other pieces of the story might not be considered true either. So the reason they didn't, all they needed to do was get some smoke started at the Pentagon and the fire dropped the roof down. It made a big enough hole after it collapsed from fire and the bombs that were in there, that it looked big enough that an airliner could have gone into that hole. So it, it, it was enough to satisfy the myth without killing a lot of uh, military personnel. And, and they kept the death toll down at the Trade Center as much as they could. A lot of people had forewarning, so the Trade Centers were virtually empty. You know, compared to, we were told 50,000 people worked there. Well, there was nowhere near 50,000 on the day of 9-11. Does that answer your question, Corrine? Thank you. Uh, okay. Right. Yes, uh, Diana. Um, Andy, could you please clarify what you said about the uh, group ISIS? Are you saying that they are not real or that they're not terrorists? What 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 were you trying to say about them? Oh, uh, what uh, the point I made about ISIS is, <clears throat> you, if you look anywhere in the world, in in the Middle East, there's always a handful of so-called terrorists that are funded by the American CIA to kill a few people and stir things up here so we can get our military in there to occupy the country. Now ISIS may be just, they may be uh, Islamic radicals that have complaints against other people or or they may just have complaints against America because you know America is, uh, the military is the most hated thing on the planet right now. Uh, all the surveys show, if you log on to some of these sites, the current surveys show you ask people what's the greatest threat to peace in the world. America is at the top, 25%, and then the other countries, 2% here, 1% there, but by far and away, everybody on the planet thinks that America is the greatest threat. And we have to, that's why ISIS is taking taking the place of Al-Qaeda. Because it's uh, the intelligence agencies, every, nobody can say that Al-Qaeda is still a threat with a straight face. Because the hoax of Bin Laden is now known. Uh, one of the books here, uh, I didn't mention it, um, Bin Laden died in 2001, shortly after 9-11, and Paul Craig Roberts' book uh, reports the, the funeral, uh, the newspaper article from the Middle East and, and others, They Fox News reported it for a day, that Osama died in 2001, and then they used Osama look-alike actors. Uh, that people have said, Osama just got better looking and younger as he aged with all the terrorist tapes. That whole whole eight years. Osama's going to kill your grandma if you don't vote Republican. <laughs> they, they were uh, mythology. It was it was all part of the hoax of the legend of Osama and of course the legend of uh, Osama, President Bush ramped up on, uh, Obama. He created the myth of capturing Osama. Uh, and the eyewitnesses on the ground over there, that, that's not what happened in Pakistan. They just made it up, and then he rode to re Obama got reelected without any uh, dissent from the Democratic Party because oh, I'm a hero. I got Osama bin Laden. It's all fairy tale, all of it. Okay, okay but I'm Are still. You on a bus? Hey. So you're gonna get out. Hey, Andy, I want to ask. Uh, first, I'd like to ask uh, 
five second question of the audience to raise their hand. I'm not taking names or pictures of anybody. What, how many of these learned, skeptical, and very well, very knowledgeable people here at the college believe that September 11, like I believe, was an inside job? And I'm raising my hand. Inside, inside job. Inside how many, inside. The question, how many believe it was done by the Bush administration and not by Osama bin Laden? That's the question. So. <clears throat> Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sure. You don't have to be afraid to raise your hand. If you believe it was done by the Bush administration, yeah, you're going to be mainstream. The longer you wait and believe the fairy tale, the fewer and fewer people will uh, believe with you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a better question yes. is how many people don't believe the official the, version? Yeah, that's a better question. Uh, the question is how many people don't believe it? the current current surveys show that over half the American public don't believe the official version. And probably half of the people in this room at least have doubts. They haven't had a chance to study 40 or 50 books like I have as a hobby, but they have doubts. And you know, it just it'll it'll come out in the public as common knowledge eventually. Uh, you didn't can finish you, your uh, question. This is uh, half of the question. The other half is uh, directed now to you, because there's been rumors and accusations that. There were certain people of certain religions, certain races, certain ethnic groups were missing on the day of September 11. I'm not going to ask you that. The only thing I'm going to ask you is, were there any vice presidents, presidents, CEOs, chairman of the board, how many high uh, corporation executives were killed on September 11? Um, how many executives or high-ranking corporate people were killed on September 11th? If there was one or two, I would be surprised. You know, the, the people up in the billionaire class, they knew what was coming. They were involved in insider trading. They, 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 don't, they don't get to work that early, but no, there was massive insider trading knowledge on Wall Street uh, that the, the event of 9-11 was going to happen Tuesday morning. You know the owner, I'm finishing with this, right, of uh, Mr. Silverstein, the owner of the Twin Towers, you know that he was missing uh, from the building that day? Yeah. You know why? He knew, he knew okay, about the events of the day. He, it was in Charlie Rose a few years ago. His wife reminded him the night before that he had a doctor appointment. Well, that's the official story. So what does that prove? That's okay. the official story. There's a lot of stories that were put out there. Well, I wasn't there because I had a doctor's appointment. No, he, he took out the billions of dollars worth of insurance two months earlier. He knew the Trade Center. Would, you couldn't be involved in that without knowing what was going on. That's why this misprision of justice, right. it's treason. It's just treason against the Time United States. Obama, what these guys... The end of your question? You had, yeah, I, I had two questions. There what's the other one? Well... Well, well I, I haven't asked the first one yet. Oh, okay, go ahead. The first question is, if a commercial airliner did not hit the Pentagon, how could they, um, how, how could they sell that lie to the American public since they were actually supposed to be passengers on the plane? I mean, it, it, it should be a death toll. And a list of individuals that died. That's the first question. Well, the second okay. question is, how in the world did they actually sell the lie about building number seven coming down without it being struck by a plane? I mean, what's the, what's the official version of that? I've never actually understood how that could be um, understood and accepted by the American people. You know, it, it, if there was no plane that hit it, but it just collapsed. Why did Building 6 come down? Well, uh, all the buildings were damaged by explosives. Uh, the, the three, the three build, uh, buildings were demolished so that they wouldn't uh, fall over one way or the other and damage other buildings. The World Trade Center was a very clean demolition where... Uh, there wasn't a lot of damage to buildings that were half a block or a block away. The damage would have been far worse if they weren't brought down the way they were. Answer to your question how they sold Building 7 coming down, they said it was office fires that were burning on one corner really hot, and they cut a couple of girders and the whole thing just came down in a, a smooth, synchronous. But they, and, um, 
the NIST official story, the government story says the initial collapse was started at this point and then the building just collapsed. We don't know what happened after that. And they ignore the evidence. They just lie. They just lie. That's how they, and the media sells it. Advertising works in America. If you hear one thing a million times in somebody else, uh, you know, 10,000 minutes of criminally insane bullshit, which is cribs, you get 10,000 minutes of cribs, one minute of truth. So everybody is reporting the cribs line. That's what we've got in America. There was a first part to his question. Bill Wendt, Mary Bennett, we didn't and answer Charlie uh, Paydock. Bill. Uh, okay. How familiar are you with the Truman Skolnick's uh, charges of CIA plot? No. When, uh, the question is, how familiar am I with uh, Sherman, Sherman's Skolnick's, Skolnick's charges of CIA plots and stuff? I'm not that familiar. I, I, I know who he is. I, I read some of his work like 20, 25 years ago, but I haven't followed his career up until now. Is he still living? No, he died about 10 years ago. Okay, that's, uh, I haven't really followed a lot of those people that passed away back then. Um, as you see, I've been immersed in current stuff that's been published since 9-11. So, uh, but, you know, the... Okay, a Mary? Yes, uh, what you just described was an elaborate uh, plot that were years in the making from people in inside the federal government itself. You know, prior to Bush being installed hey. in the White House, we had the Clinton administration. I don't know if that cost you pay yeah, So, by the picture, aren't you uh, implicating them as well? I tell you, you know uh, <laughs> The, the events of night, the, the question was, what we've described here tonight took years of planning. That's pretty much accepted by all analysts. 9-11 just didn't crop, crop up overnight as a surprise. It, took, it takes years in the planning to de determine which heads of which agencies you have to have one of your good old boys in. You know, you, you have to have people that would adhere to the official line rather than step out and blow the whistle. Uh, or risk getting killed by, uh, you know, blowing the whistle on him. So, you know, her, in answer to her question, the preparation for this started years in advance, and the people that occupied, the, the 20, there were 24 people, 25, I forget the number, whether it's 24 or 25, was the signatories of a think tank called the Project for a New American Century. That was Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, they produced this report called Rebuilding America's Defenses. Uh, Richard Pearl, who, who was considered the Prince of Darkness back in the 80s. I mean, these people that were uh, uh, devotees of Henry Kissinger and, you know, uh, you know, reducing the world's population. They were, they were discredited and many of them out of, out of favor when Clinton took office. So they just bided their time and uh, they produced this report, and they were all—they all had jobs in you know, corporate, you know, America, and they were ready to become appointees in the Bush administration to the heads of the key positions when Bush got control of the White House. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it wasn't the entire government that did this. No, it was key positions. That he's in a meeting. Just, just, it's just. Well, the question that this woman, for those of you that uh, didn't hear her question, um, she asked if, if such a thing, if so many people were involved planning it, uh, how come nobody leaked it? Well, the pe people that tried to leak things got killed, and everybody shut up really, really quick. I mean, the people that were uh, talking about leaking anthra, 24 of them got killed. Senator Paul Wellstone got killed 10 days before the election. People that were in a position to leak this information to the American people that they weren't involved in it, you know, uh, or even the people that were involved, they knew that if they leaked it, Bush and Cheney had no problem just sending a hit team out to kill them. They were, you know, this is why the Democratic, for those of you that haven't studied this, you know, we were, we, I had questions for a long time, says why don't the Democrats 
oppose anything the Bush Cheney's doing. They're just lying on the floor like jellyfish for the first six years. There was no no opposition. Bush Cheney ran roughshod over this country with a 51 to 49 majority in the Senate up until 2006. And the reason for that is the Democrats, people that wanted to live to fight another day, they knew they weren't dealing with politicians. They were dealing with criminals and killers. That's who ran our government for six solid years unopposed and then the vote rose up in 2006 and they took back control of some of the government and then 2008 it was a landslide. But for the first six years of Bush Cheney, no, the, the, our country has never seen a government like this, ever. Hey, and then that's the reason. Off. Yes, Andy, you just said, and you got it printed here, that this was a conventional controlled, the clean controlled demolition, but on the other side, you say the Twin Towers went sideways, and the one tower came down, it was at 23 degrees what, which before it came down, and also conventional demolition is from the bottom up. Uh, not from the top down, and also the debris field, even according to that book you held up, said the debris field was spread over six times the footprint of the building of 200 meters. That's not very clean. That's, that's like well, the whole loop. <laughs> yeah. It, it, what it was, and if you that, saw that picture, that dust, that's a clean... What we're thing. saying is... Uh, and then... One more thing, I... Okay, what's your question? question? What's your question? One more thing. What's your question? Let me finish, goddammit. I lived in New York, and he says it's clean, but there was debris. I still remember this. Even over in the Winter Garden, that stuff was all over New York. Well, that's my point, that, uh, you know, the, the, the explosions blew parts of girders and debris. The debris field was far wider. The debris field showed clear evidence of massive explosions. This wasn't a, 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 a controlled demolition where things are falling down in their own footprint. The Twin Towers had massive explosives packed all through there and maybe something else that converted a lot of the steel and uh, uh, there are pictures of the top of one tower leaning a little bit and then it converted to dust. In the next few frames going down, it was no longer there. It was part of the dust cloud moving in the wind. That that piece that broke off early because it wasn't quite straight, after the rest of the explosives were triggered, everything was converted to, to dust mainly, other than a, a pieces of girders that shot out in the debris field like what you're talking about. One that uh, was converted to dust by the explosion? What? How was it converted to dust? Uh, the debate now is over what kind of energy was used to produce the microscopic dust. He said normal explosions don't produce tons of uh, microscopic dust that's fine like powder. Uh, there, uh, one group of people thinks that it was something new that the military has that they've been working on for a long time like mini nukes that can uh, you know, uh, direct an energy beam from the blast in, in a certain area. <laughs> And without damaging uh, buildings around it. Really, they've been working on really small nukes for 30 and 40 years. The, uh, her thesis is that it showed evidence of some kind of beam energy weapon that was produced during the Star Wars program, or something else that is able. You're able to shine it down into a building, and uh, the, the building just disintegrates. It's called the Hutchison effect. Uh, the military is working on it. And the Canadian researcher has all kinds of pictures of, uh, you know, girders just bending uh, or pieces of metal bending at room temperature in a certain, uh, you work with radio frequency, uh, static, static charges in certain radio frequencies that cause a, a resonance in the material, then it just starts to It turns to dust? Exactly. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, so it turns to dust. The, the molecules just uh, disassociate from each other and you got a whole bunch of dust. It's in this book called Where Do the Towers Go? Uh, Ted Arada. Uh, Ted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that gentleman over there, he had a two-part question, and you didn't answer his first part, and I wanted to ask more. Okay, later. I'm sorry I missed that. Yeah, did, the, uh, uh, repeat it. Tell uh, me again. The uh, first part was about what happened to the passengers. If, oh, okay. If uh, the, that it was a commercial airline. What happened to the passengers? 
uh, it appears that uh, some of the manifests that we were told, uh, or some of the planes where they listed names, some of those people weren't on the planes. Um, the, none of the manifests show the names of any of the hijackers that we were shown on television. They're not on any of the published manifests. The hijackers aren't. Uh, I just read an article that said, why, do we ex why, do, why is it so hard to believe that some planes took off and the passengers went elsewhere when we had a successful, we've had a very successful witness protection program in this country for a long time. People just disappear and get a new life. It would, it, would, it would have been less than a billion dollars, you know, to provide the, the, all four planes took off with very light loads. And their uh, researchers think that all four of those planes landed in Cleveland and went to a, a hangar near the air, end of the airport where they, they dipped down below the radar line in a dead area of radar and another military plane flew right over and took their spot in the air. Those, those four planes, the plane traces, they crossed over other planes flying in, so one plane with passengers would dip down under and land, and then the other plane just followed, and the air traffic controllers that day couldn't tell that, because the, the transponders were shut off. All they saw was blips on the radar. There were four military war games going on with simulated blips of planes flying into the tower, the White House, the Pentagon, so the air traffic controllers were constantly saying, along with the military people watching the radar screens, is this live? Is it? Or is this? Is this part of the exercise today, or is this real world? They didn't know for two hours because so many false blips were put into the radar screens by the the military exercises that they were running that morning. Okay. I, ha I had my own. Specific and you got your own question. Does that answer your question over there? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, it was. It's a similar question. Um, there were like a few hundred people total on the, supposedly on those four planes, right? Right. Okay. And did you say just now something about the manifest? Were those people known, those individuals? Uh, some were known, uh, in, in, uh, but a lot, a lot of the, the, the remains, the, the DNA to a lot of those people was never produced. Uh, the, the DNA to some of them were. So the, the theory is that you know some of them uh, were loaded on a plane and crashed somewhere, or they were just murdered. But we don't know. Uh, you know, it's part of what needs to be investigated. Hasn't anybody gone through the list and uh, found out uh, if these individuals were still walking around somewhere, where they were? I mean, that well, wouldn't be. Well, they they've gone through the list of the hijackers. No, those guys. No, those no. guys are walking around in the Middle East. They weren't even on the planes here in America. But, but that's the Middle East. Yeah, well, that, we, that's, have we have Americans uh, on the planes. American. No, I I don't have anybody that's been able to. Uh, I have not run across it myself. I didn't, didn't think to Google it. It wasn't important to me. You know, after, uh, you know, these are all side issues that aren't important. You know, maybe they're in the witness protection program, maybe some of them died. It doesn't matter. We have to do something about the Patriot Act. We have to do something about the military sending tanks out into Iowa and everywhere else to militarize America. That's what's important right now. On down the line, we might find out who would happen to some of those people. Maybe we'll never find out where they went. But just like you say, it's it's just not it's not important to know what kind of plane hit the World Trade Center because the plane crashes had no effect at all on the stru structural right, integrity of the towers. You have a question? Right, yes. That important. is about on the back your new uh, article here that you produced today. Uh, you have a hundred million Americans don't believe. And 150 million Americans uh, doubt or, or disbelieve. And then you have tens of thousands of scientists. Uh, you quote these figures. And what, what is the basis for them? Okay, the question, if you didn't hear his question, the question is, we quote figures like tens of thousands of scientists working on 9-11. Well, tens of thousands is probably a low number compared to all the other countries that have uh, scientific groups. Uh, there's a very, very large body of data of, of people working on the, in the nine, the so-called worldwide 9/11 truth movement, because 9/11 is affecting other countries with the American military-industrial killing machine. So, uh, and the question uh, uh, I take you when I say we're half, about half of America is up to believing. The public, half the public believes that the official story is false. That's in the polls. Uh, 
uh, several polls have been conducted by uh, research groups, you know, just like they conduct a poll on whether you're Republican or Democrat. Well, uh, the, the groups that are doing 9-11 research, and you see you see the results of these, 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 okay, did any of you miss the fact that I say that a poll like that will never be published in the Tribune, Sun-Times, Daily Herald? They're running a coordinated blackout on what is happening. You know, there, uh, Project Censored has been up and running for 37 years, and I'm constantly seeing journalism. People have been working in journalism for 20 years, and they never heard of Project Censored. That's how successfully that thing is blacked out, because it teaches people how the media runs coordinated <coughs> blackouts on things they don't want the American public to know. We're living in a bubble of mythology. And if you log on, if you know where the information is, the websites, you can read articles from all over the world, you get a feel for how many thousands of people are involved in this. And so, you know, you come see me afterwards, I can give you references, I can tell you about websites. And, you know, there's, there's a blizzard of information if you're willing to just look at it. It's, it's all over the place. No more questions for our speaker. Oh, yes, uh, 303. Uh, he, uh, years ago, uh, the reporters uh, interviewing a fireman that was on, the, that came to the scene at the Trade Center, mm -hmm. and he uh, mentioned he heard an explosion. Now, mm -hmm. he heard the explosion once he got there. He didn't have an explosion when he was at home. So that tells me that it didn't come from the plane hit the noise. Now, yesterday in the sun time, or uh, uh, Thursday in the sun time, a guy's last name is it's B A C S O, Baxo. I believe the first name is Don. Exactly at, at the Willis Tower now. Mm -hmm. He was working in the Trade Center, and he said he was there. And blah blah blah. And he he wasn't with none of this. He was down at one union club for big time uh, business type going give their speech and so forth and so on. And he said that he was, he was working in the towers on the sixth sixth floor, and the plane hit the building and shook the building. And after that, he heard a big explosion. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious. Do you got any information on some of the people who were... Uh, uh, yeah, that's what he just asked. Is there information on the explosions? In the firefighters' testimony, you can log on to Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, Architects and now, Engineers, hold, hold that's A&E. Hold it down. Uh, years ago, I don't know if it was five or six years ago, we're talking about this fire. It had nothing to do with telling the truth about what this or, or who is that. He was just responding to the interview. Now the guy, uh, Friday, he was at the union club or wherever the big shots go, and he was the speaker. And he was talking about, since 911 was just, you know, was celebrating or whatever, mm -hmm. he was the he memorial. was saying, he was there, and he was telling about what happened to him, what he felt, and so he wasn't talking about who, who did what, but it, it, it comes... It, it he gave an eyewitness it, report? It brought back the, the memory of the fabric to me. In other words, the plane doesn't hit the thing by time the fly, but uh, the fireman get there. Mm -hmm. So he had this explosion, and had this guy say he had big explosion. The, well, he's correct. You know, you know, there are hundreds of eyewitnesses just like him that heard explosions in the basement of the towers before and after the planes hit. There were there are there's hundreds of eyewitnesses, uh, hundreds of them in the fire department alone in the oral testimonies, oral histories that talk about all the explosions they heard before the buildings came down. They heard explosions blowing the internal cores apart and things, prepping the buildings for the final dustification. So you're absolutely right. You know there's and of course the 9/11 Commission report just ignored all these people. That's why they, they gave the impression, well, we didn't hear of anybody that, you know, they, they physically pushed people away and told them, you can't testify in the commission because you would tell us that you heard bombs going off. We can't have that. That's the 9-11 commission that was put out by the government. Here, uh, the gentleman in the back. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, okay. I just want to say it's more of a commentary than a uh, question. Uh, uh, you got a uh, nice uh, question uh, for him? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. Have you got a question? <laughs> Have you got a question? Yeah, I'll get my question, question is, is my question is, all right, my follow. question is then, do you feel that you made a convincing presentation on the case of the evidentiary basis alone? The question is, um, do I feel I made a case 
a strong case on the basis of the evidence alone? I think you have to say yes. I think the facts speak for themselves. And if anybody has asked me where the references are, you know, I'm, I'm listing facts that are forensic evidence that have been proven. We're not talking about theory here. Theory and opinion is something else. But there's a whole bunch of things that have been factually determined by the forensic investigators from a variety of sources. It's, not, it's like, like I, what I call Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends saying there's evidence that the Earth is round. I mean, the database on the round Earth side is pretty big. But there's still some people in the Flat Earth Society in England, they call us ball earthers. What are you going to do? Uh, you know, there's some people that are immune to facts. But at some point, maybe you weren't here when I gave the earlier... In, in, in this country, we used to debate whether smoking four packs a day was harmful to your health. Oh, they oh, used to, there. Okay. You're here. Yeah, and knowledge moves forward up the Galileo curve in the direction of truth. And once the database gets so big, then uh, it has more credibility. And, and, and if it can be independently uh, proven and researched for independence. So I hope that answers your question. But the, as far as as far as I can see, and the, the scientists that are writing these books, the the evidence for what I told you tonight is overwhelming and a slam dunk for any jury in any court where the judge isn't bought off. Okay. Uh, Karina and then Charlie. Charlie. Okay. Um, these are the last questions. We'll move on to our. Could you? I was curious whether on 9-11 did you think it was a conspiracy on the morning of 9-11? Corinna's question was, did I think it was a conspiracy on the morning of 9-11? Uh, I was sitting in my home watching the TV like everybody else. I wasn't in New York, so I didn't hear the explosions going off. What I thought on 9-11 was it was blowback, payback, for us slaughtering women and children in the foreign lands. That's what I initially thought. And then um, I bought the story uh, like everybody else. Uh, but in answer to her question, the, the one doubt I had, all day long they said there were 50,000 people working in the towers on a normal day. They didn't tell us that the towers were near empty or 75% empty. So when I learned that the death toll, the final death toll, ended up being about 3,000, I thought to myself, my thought was, if you dropped a bomb in near, near one of the end zones on Super Bowl Sunday, they said the Super Bowl was bombed at halftime, and 122 people were killed. I'd say, uh, you, what's wrong with that picture there? You dropped a major bomb in Super Bowl, uh, you should kill thousands. How come only 122 people at the stadiums wiped out, but only 122 people died? You know that the official story doesn't match the forensic evidence, and I didn't I didn't look into it, or I didn't I didn't have my computer up and running in two, in 2001. I only got my computer in 2004, before the election. So my brother had been doing all our computer work, and uh, so we we weren't really searching the internet for the 9/11 truth sites until about 2004. That's when I picked it up and some of these good books were already published and I followed David Ray Griffin's career ever since you know, with the 10 books he's right, published. Charles, you have the last question. All right, um, regarding these explosions, isn't that largely come out of Willie Rodriguez, the custodian who's on the talk circuit and I came across a list of six things that might conceivably explode in a big office building, like equipment with oil reservoirs, lubrication, plus you've got windows popping, trestles falling, elevators crashing. Are those all thrown in the explosion thing? Well, uh, William Rodriguez, he worked at the Trade Center, and he was familiar with it, so you know, they, they've never really uh, been able to discredit his testimony. He just, he's just basically ignored by the mainstream media. But, you know, Rodriguez was one of several hundred eyewitnesses that were in and around the towers that day in the lobby uh, when, when, a, when an explosion went off. People reported explosions from, from a few minutes before the first plane hit. There were multiple explosions in both towers. 
and blowing girders apart and, and walls and everything. So, uh, and also they have they have debunked the idea that the kerosene from the jet fuel ran down the elevator and set everything on fire. No, that that's not what happened. Those those things are sealed, uh, so so that you can't have a fire that would just you know travel up or down the building. All right, moving on to our rebuttal period. I see Dan's hand. Uh, how many other uh, questions or answers or uh, information to impart the rest to the rest of us? One, two, three, four, five. Thank you, my friend. Thanks. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. About four, uh, four Andy, minutes. Uh, yeah, and Johnny, uh, you had your hand up uh, before. Uh, you can raise your questions in the rebuttal period just as well. How Brian? Let's thank our speaker. Yeah, well done, Jim. Encore. Yeah, we want our three books. <laughs> Okay, four minutes apiece. Four minutes apiece and a one minute warning. Oh, America, bus. No, what's the idea? Greek American lawyer, uh, born south of Athens, north of Sparta, came here on the boat like Columbus at the age of eight, 1946. And uh, being one of the elder uh, wise men over there, or wise guys, if you want, at the Greek Cafe Neon, there's a coffee house over here on Lawrence Avenue, I said, uh, to respond to this young lady here to the right, uh, I said, they say, Yalabas, what happened? You know, the day, I said, September 11th, I said, you got to wait 24 hours or 48 hours because for every action, there's going to be a reaction. Sit down there. So I said, we got to see the reaction before you know who's behind September 11. So a day later, after Bush came out with this elaborate and sophisticated, highly planned explanation with the, all the laws that were going into effect and everything they're going to do to fight terrorism, I said, it was an inside job. And I said, those airplanes were not uh, manned, uh, piloted into those buildings. They were directed in those buildings by remote control. Like I've seen 35, 40 years ago, they were doing that over by Irving Park and Cumberland when they played those little airplanes where they, I said, that's how they got those airplanes there. Those guys didn't know how to fly airplanes. So I said, this is who's behind it. So now, uh, all these years later, we're in the second decade of World War III. That was a causus belli. And so they had to do a horrible thing to people, innocent people, in order to justify slaughter of millions of people. For the, not for one decade or two decades, I think President Bush said this is going to last for the entire 21st century. And the great uh, mulatto presidential impersonator <laughs> Barack Obama he had, they had all written out for him, you know, after they killed these two unfortunate young men with masked men who were, we don't know, they were probably inside, that's what, it's inside job too. We didn't prove who killed these, cut their heads off, but that was a cause of Belli to expand the war to Africa, and then he said also Middle East, and then there's terrible criminals and uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, fanatic uh, Islamists, they're going to kill us in Europe, in England, and the United States. So this is, in a way, tightening the noose around us so that five years from now we won't be able to express any kind of opinions like this because September 11 became a religion. I've thought of this for over 10 years, and uh, I'm going to read 25 words or less here. About One book, minute. 1999 book about the Christ conspiracy. The conversion methods by Catholics against men, women, and children included burning, hanging, and torture of all manner. So far, this despicable legacy in the crime against humanity is inexplicably receiving the undying and unthinking support of hundreds of millions, including the educated. 
doctors, lawyers, scientists, etc. So here, this theological garbage that was the Virgin Mary uh, bringing in the Son of God into the world, which was a total falsehood, is repeated on September 11, 2001. And this is to destroy a civilization as we've known it for the last two, three thousand years and bring in a new world order, which is now World War III in the second decade. And I'm sorry to inform you, I wish it was untrue, but your time is up. The worst is yet to come. Your time oh. is up. I'm getting home. I'm not saying anything. I have a lot of memories of Sherman Skolnick. He didn't want to talk me how to use a law library. Which I think is used to saying anyway. It's something that everybody ought to know how to do. But anyway, he had a lot of theories about CIA conspiracies and CIA fronts and so on. And I saw this show on Channel 11 last week about the British intelligence doing much the same thing. It said that the British intelligence trained the French resistance, which was basically a terrorist operation, what well, today would call it terrorism. And uh, said a few things about British intelligence setting up businesses as fronts. Uh, I think the way to cut the military budget is to invoke that good old military strategy that strategy or strategy is 90% logistics. And the way you do that is by cutting out the funding, get rid of the central bank and the income tax, and a lot of us will come to a screeching halt. But uh, people do resist change, even at the college of complexes. I had, used to resist the uh, Kennedy assassination theories and the 9-11 uh, theories until I saw the Zabruder film on a little UHF television program which showed Kennedy's head uh, bending forward. No, it was bending backward. Like he got hit from the front. And I resisted the 9-11 uh, conspiracy theories until I saw this film about the towers coming down at the speed of gravity, which wouldn't have happened if there had been a uh, normal demolition. Um, Took 30 seconds. Well, I guess I can leave it at that. <laughs> Next. Hey, watch yourself so he can, I can get that. Yeah, I was listening to, uh, <coughs> pardon, I was listening to Amy Goodman the other day, and uh, Mrs. Foley, you know, the one that was beheaded by ISIS, she sent letters to President Obama and different people in the government trying to get her son released. And she'd done this over and over again because she knew that her son would be beheaded after a while. She didn't do that. Now what happened is the government told her to stop sending these letters. That it's none of her business what's going on with the government. So we could see that the government was using this as an emotional incentive to go to war. Thank you. Now the other uh, person that was killed, I don't remember his name exactly, but somebody betrayed him in the so-called Syrian moderate resistance movement. And he got a lot of money for that. So he was beheaded. 
Now, if you look at Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia does that on a regular basis. I don't know how many thousands of people are beheaded every year in Saudi Arabia. So this is a real phony issue. The main thing is to get people emotionally so upset that they want to go to war. And you've got to look out for these so-called social democrats, like Bernie Sanders. He's a phony from the word go. And I'll tell you why. One time he was on Bill Hartman's show, and somebody called up and said, we're using uh, du diluted uranium, depleted. De depleted uranium, to kill people in Iraq, and a lot of people were getting sick. And he denied it. He just out and out denied it. And the other day I was listening to him, and he's for President Obama going in there and starting another war, especially with Syria. They want to bomb Syria. Now that's starting another war, and also, of course, we're going into Russia and things of that nature. And we have to take this very seriously. The United States cannot exist without a war economy. And that's why it's constantly going to war. Empires either expand or they die, one or the other. And the system itself is so damn corrupt that the only way you're going to get to do away with this is not to allow people to make all this fabulous wealth. Lately, there's been 85 people in the world that control half the world, half the wealth of this globe. That's how uh, despicable it is becoming. I like what you said. Um, I'm just going to make a few comments. Um, on I watched this video of the nine uh, of the twin towers collapsing uh, not that long ago to refresh my memory to, to try to invest, start to investigate this thing. And what struck me was that while uh, the, the buildings were burning, you know, toward the top, one of them was like toward the top, and the other one was uh, sort of in the middle. Uh, people were filming this and with a with a, 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 a audio as well, and they were just ch ch kind of chattering, kind of lightly speculating what was going on. And then when the towers actually collapsed, people were like, "What the hell is that?" They, I think they were more shocked by that than the planes flying in, because it didn't make any apparent sense. There was no obvious reason why those buildings should collapse the way they did, and and to be pulverized like this. Okay, so the visual evidence, when I look at this, it looks a hell of a lot more like a demolition uh, than just collapsing because of some supposed fire up there. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so that struck me. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that uh, we don't have to know exactly uh, how this was done or by whom to seriously question the official story. The official story does not make sense, uh, to me anyway. Uh, has anybody seen the video of the collapse of Building 7? Yes. A show of hands, please. Okay. That looks like a, exactly like a demolition, a planned demolition. The Twin Towers, it's fudgy, you know, well, there's this smoke in, uh, from the fires, etc., etc. But this other building, there was no plane going into that. It looked just like, exactly like a demolition. And uh, I read an, an account or an analysis by a trained engineer, an independent engineer, and he said, that was a collapse. He didn't even know. When, when they showed in the video, he didn't even know about uh, uh, that uh, that building had collapsed. He only knew about the Twin Towers. He said, uh, and they didn't tell him that this happened on 9-11. And he said, that, that's a collapse, period. And then they told him, well, that happened on 9-11. He said, well, that's, you know, that had nothing to do with any planes or anything, anything like that. That was just a, a planned demolition. Um, the Pentagon, Pentagon scenario doesn't make any sense at all. There's no photos. Uh, Andy, Andy uh, described the, the little hole and this and that and the other. Uh, the and then the precision of the piloting of all of these planes, you know, uh, by, by untrained and non-pilots uh, who trained supposedly on Cessnas or whatever. They didn't train on 737s or 747s, they trained on little Cessnas. Okay, so 
The whole thing just doesn't make very much sense. It's not a coherent official story. And that's where I think the questioning has to start. And the last thing I want to say is that civilized, quote unquote, civilized governments are capable of horrendous, tremendously horrendous things. Nobody would have expected in the 1920s that uh, the Nazi government could carry out, or any government could carry out something like the Holocaust. And there you have a, a relatively small number of people at the top of the Nazi party, of the Nazi government, doing this totally outrageous thing. Governments that are supposedly civilized, Western governments, in our, these representative uh, republics, uh, blah, 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 bullshit governments of ours, can do these kinds of things, and they probably have, and they probably will continue. It's time to move on. The first one dies, woman would be married by this time, and you know, say, hey, Good job. That's, that's in my, my previous life. We, what is happening is that news media is driving the events, and that is what is happening in a two people. I agree with the previous speaker, uh, no one before that. That are two people were beheaded. I mean, it wasn't. It's not sufficient reason, in my opinion, to go to war and to to invest so much money and so much headaches. The America need to cool down the temperature in the world. Virtually, we are finding a no ally in our adventures. We have a diminishing return in all over including Western Europe, people do not want to support us as much as we think. People, ordinary people on the street across the world, they think that we are just trigger happy, have gone, will travel. And they do not want that. They want to raise their kids, they want, they want to be happy, they want to work, they want to eat well and enjoy their life. They do not want this war after war after war. And uh, so I'm going to, number one, Israel. Everybody agrees, everybody agrees that what is the final solution is already there, yes. blueprint is there. And only person can do the United States. And United States is not providing leadership and that is the reason that problem is not solved. Second thing, on a Soviet Union, we do not have to have problem with Soviet Union. You know, it is very clear to even, even uh, what is this guy? the security advisor, anyway, he, he wrote a book, World Order, recently. And uh, he said that uh, Barack, we, our government should not talk about, to put, about Putin in insulting way. Because that doesn't, if you talk to foreign leader in insulting way, you do not solve a problem. Second thing is that Russia do have a legitimate interest in a color countries. And we have to acknowledge that interest because they are culturally and historically connected. And we cannot create, create an atmosphere which is creates high tension and a problem and hurts the economy of Europe and Soviet Union. Third thing about Muslim. Let's, let's be clear. Muslims are here and they are going to stay. And they are going to stay in a large segment of all. Okay. One minute. And we got to get used to that. And we got to find out a way and a way to how we can accommodate. We got to start thinking how can we accommodate them? And it is not going to be accommodated. We hate we hate Muslims or we're going to be trigger happy and buy. Let let ISIS ISIS has been the most aspiring a event in the history of Muslim world in a recently. And lots of people, particularly Sunnis, like them. Okay? And I think if we let them to, to say that, hey, you can do peacefully and do not and do a war but don't 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 hurt the ordinary people and we can come to somewhere. But we have to lower the temperature. If we don't lower the temperature will create a problem because we are the strongest people, we are the largest military, and we have lots of firepower. We can hurt. Thank you. Well done, Raj. Well done.
right, let's thank our speaker again. I'm going to go a little early tonight. I'll be eclectic. Let me know when I got a minute to go. I will. This all started in France. That one guy made this came out to book the big lie. He made a video which was actually was kind of offensive. He thought it was all humorous and he was laughing at the United States. I really didn't care for that one at all. We had uh, Jim Feitzer here who was right at the beginning was the, the founder of the Scholars and Academics uh, for Truth on this. Uh, he made a presentation. His big thing is about this Pentagon hole, which actually I think is more like about 150 feet. It's a little bit sizable. But anyhow, the other group that's out there, I'm going to give you a little history, is these architects and engineers for truth. They're led by a guy named Gage. I think he's a little taken up with his position, but that's okay, it happens. Uh, there's not a lot of architects and engineers in the group in terms of the... There's 83,000 architects in the United States, a million and a half engineers. They try to be a worldwide organization, but they're throwing some interesting things. Their big thing is it's got to be a controlled demolition. That's their major argument. Uh, along came some kids in New York, and I mean, if they're the young guys, and a little budget thing came out, a documentary, Loose Change, generated some discussion. Uh, they were followed up about the same time, and I'm surprised he had Popular Mechanics here, because Popular Mechanics not only had a very, very popular issue and published a separate book uh, debunking the conspiracy theories. Uh, also on the other side was Skeptic Magazines, a guy called Sherman, and he's going around. Uh, sure. we, that's the term that's used, debunked. <laughs> um, you can look up a lot of these. I, oddly enough, the oddest one, Alex Jones is another one running around saying the government even the National Geographic got involved. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't talk more about therm, uh, thermite, thermate, neothermite, this exploding paint. Uh, actually, I don't think that stuff works. It's a slow burning thing, and How do you know? it ain't going to work. There's been experiments. There's a video where a guy tried desperately to get it to sever a beam, and he spent like a week. And it's, it's kind of interesting. That's admitting it's good experimenting. It's not, it's easy to say. Um, actually, even Flo Mike Flores and I agree on this. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, you might not know him. He's a, he and I agree that it's, that it's just pain. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the other thing, it's a conspiracy by who? George Bush, a guy who doesn't even know how to tie his shoes? The other one I, yeah, I got into, you, and you call this a physics textbook, the woman, uh, Judy Woods, with her, her, she calls it a gizmo, was focused on the buildings and they turned it on and this thing called dustification. You have, each of those floors is three million pounds or more about a billion and a half building coming down on each one. Yeah, it's going to dust the mine. What do you think it's going to do to that that's below it? Of course it's going to, you know, she, and it's not physics at all. She, they asked her, Where's, how does this device work? She said, oh, that's a distraction. You're, you're distracting from the truth or something, you know. You cannot turn on a machine and turn steel into dust. It hasn't been done in a lab anywhere that I'm aware of. Let's see, what else? Right. And the, two more Charlie. things. Wait a minute, I thought I had another minute. Um, <laughs> I worked in building, I represented the trades and crafts, custodians and all that. You must have somewhere between 500 to 2,000 employees in those buildings. To do something clandestinely, they're small communities, it is not going to happen. Plumbers, mechanical maintenance, Custodians, uh, electricians, lampists, elevator inspectors. Last thing is, I just wanted to say about dustification, and this is something you're not going to get on the internet. I was reading about, they said it was dustified, these buildings. And I actually came across this, I said, I just read about this. And I went back in Rotterdam in World War II. The guy says four kilometer, four kilometer, well actually four square miles 
of Rotterdam was turned to dust by German bombers. And he said in all space it was almost impossible to find a piece of building material as large as your fist. It was as though the entire heap of rooms had been painstakingly shattered with sledgehammers. This is what happens in these situations. Anyhow, thank you. I think we got a lot of kick around. I don't think this issue is dead, though. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you forgot relevant yeah, the to the organization <laughs> of the family. <laughs> you shoot anybody, beat up any? I will say that I, I actually was at Ground Zero the day after the Twin Towers collapsed. I was teaching and living in New York at the time, even though I am from Chicago. There was a lot of dust. It took me about five and a half hours to actually get down to Ground Zero because there were barricades or National Guard patrols making sure people weren't going down there. But I am the type that just had a see for myself, and I made it down there. And once I got down there, I saw, much to my surprise, there were at least a thousand or two thousand uh, citizens who also had gotten down there, and our whole intent was to help. And once we got there, we were put on the line, and it was really almost comical in a sense. We were in these lines with these five-gallon pickle barrels, those plastic pails, and just filling it and moving it out to the street, trying to see if we could actually save anyone that was under that. And of course, there were no survivors. So there was a lot of dust. I can't attest to that. My refutation or rebuttal is not so much that it may have been an inside job. Initially, I didn't think that. Over time, I think a little differently. My refutation is your presentation could have been much better improved by relying mostly on facts and attribution. Having piles of books is not as helpful as making good, clear, solid assertions supported by the authors or the experts that you're attributing things to. You made a lot of general statements that were highly inflammatory. Your presentation seemed more like an anti-Bush campaign than a, the evidentiary nature of why 9-11 was an inside job. I brought a book to indicate why I have come around to believe that it may have been an inside job. And that book is Day of Deceit, The Truth About FDR and Pearl Harbor. I would, I would say with pretty high confidence, any reasonable person reading this book would realize that yes, the government is capable of some pretty horrific things. After reading this book, and the author based his 10 years or so of research on thousands of copies that he obtained through the then recently passed Freedom of Information Act, which is uh, something that I've also utilized in my um, life as a local activist in Lake County to get records of local agencies. But the Freedom of Information Act reveals that FDR and several of his top military commanders had a nine-point plan, and that last point was to get Japan to attack Pearl Harbor, because they knew that was the only way they can go into the war with the public support. So it's pretty amazing, after reading this, understanding that at the highest echelons of power, <coughs> Um, it's a chess game, and it's sad that the people, citizens, for Harbor's case, the soldiers who were killed, the power was, uh, and knowledge of what was going on was taken out of the hands of the uh, Pacific Fleet commander. He knew nothing about that. He was not. He was kept out of the loop, and the U.S. had cracked the Japanese code, so they knew what was coming on. They had all the communications, but that was planned, and they allowed it to happen. In fact, they basically forced Japan's hand to be complicit in it happening in order for Roosevelt to then go in front of the American people. And of course, the Senate and everyone was completely for going into World War II to, to help in that way. Before that, the polls, 12%, were for and 88 against. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have uh, some in the
individual told me that he knew what comforts a chicken or uh, egg, I would be silly to debate him. I would go out the door. If he wanted to say, I know which one comes first, good for him. Well, a lot of people kind of approach this 911 the same way. Oh, and by the way, in a very intelligent way to ask uh, the question you said, forget about, you know, this and that. Do you believe the official version? To me, is a legit question. And me, as an individual, like all other human beings, they got brain, they got eyes, they got ears. And all of that was given to the individual, so he or she can look at something and say something about it. They can hear something and they can say something uh, or say something about that. Now, when you say that a plane can run into a building and knock it down, uh, why don't you tell me that a uh, chicken came before the egg? Or the eggs came before the chicken. Because ain't nowhere in the history of the world, and he mentioned something about physics, uh, 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 Paydock mentioned something about physics. <laughs> well, physics is the one that tells me that I can't buy the official version. In the history of the world, ain't no fire ever caused a building to collapse. First of all, physics also tells me when I went to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and when I looked through the cracks when they was building the Sears Tower, when I went to the thing up there, they tell you, say, well, you got 15 minutes, you can go and we'll show you how we built this building. Well, I take my 15 minutes before I went up to the tower and, and watch when they was building this building. And I can't have opinion. Uh, 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 that is uh, uh, consistent with physics and say that man there ain't no way in the hell that no fire gonna bring no building down. Secondly, uh, at the Smithsonian, the high rise was built in Chicago and that was the breakthrough back in 1880 something. What that said, they said we can build a building as almost as tall as we want and it's standing there. Ain't no wind gonna blow it over. Ain't no hurricane gonna blow it over just because it's up uh, uh, next, uh, so forth, so on. So I'm saying, when you uh, 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 see these uh, heady things and you see them as facts, and somebody comes to you and says, "Well, a plane can knock it over, or a fire can knock this over, or this and that," forget that. The other thing uh, I want to say is, I'm not here to say who did this. Forget who killed Kennedy, who burnt down the building. I'm telling you that the official version ain't shit. And I'm not buying that because I'm not dead. I got eyes, I got ears, I heard it, I saw it, One minute. et cetera. So when we uh, uh, start to uh, defending this, like the uh, Charles Paydock over there talking about this don't burn and that don't burn and so how, what kind of physics degree he had? At least these books here, these people got a little thing behind the thing that say, oh, uh, a PhD, a uh, professor at such such college and so forth and so on. Well, guess what? I'm going to take this his thing over when he's speaking something about physics, not Charles Paydock. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paydock tell me something about it. Oh, poor uh, Charles. Uh, oh, he's kidding uh, what do you call that when you poor Charlie. take your book? I'm going to put you on an airplane and you're going to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Gene? He went to Philly. <laughs> I'm going to put you in the witness room. Okay. Next, right. next speaker. I got a little take, a different take on all this stuff. Um, I think airplanes did crash into those buildings, by the way. Um, who here has seen the website HalliburtonWatch.org? Anybody seen HalliburtonWatch.org? One person? It's kind of like keeps tabs on Dick Cheney and Big Oil. So, you know, I think there's some weird things about 9-11. One, Boeing, which stands for Bombs Over Everything, moved to Chicago 
a week before 9-11, all their, for the personal purpose, you know, four, built, four Boeing planes crashed into things, and Boeing is our biggest defense contractor, and they wanted to be closer to Washington and the Middle East for their executives and the war machine. So I thought that was kind of weird that that happened right before 9-11. And the other thing that seems weird to me is Bush, with his trillions of dollars and his big military and Cheney, with his all that money and all that intelligence and all that going on for the eight years that they were in office, they didn't even get close to catching Bin Laden. I don't think I remember them even being on his heels at all. It's just some, you know, he was in a cave somewhere. But Obama shows up, and two years into his presidency, they have a bullet in his head. Two or three years, whatever it took. So I know that bin Laden and the Bushes were friends, and it seems to me that I think there is a conspiracy here. This is my take on it. Uh, if you do go to HaliburtonWatch.org, you know there's always a hankering for some big-time oil wars. Because most of our oil, the world's oil, is in the Middle East. I have a feeling that there was some kind of deal with Bin Laden brainwashing these kids to go on those planes, hijack them, have them go into an air, uh, go into the World Trade Center, and in the deal, Bin Laden get gets to escape, and we won't put the heat on him. But Obama did, <laughs> and he shot him. So um, that seems weird that Bush never caught Bin Laden. It seems weird that Boeing came to Chicago just to ramp up the war effort. And um, that's kind of my take on this stuff. And I think that airplanes did go in there. But I just think that upstream, Andy, that there was a conspiracy. There could be. Knowing Cheney and knowing Big Oil. And we will be in oil wars for a long time. And, by the way, ISIS is an oil war. If you go and put in Google ISIS map, ISIS now is surrounding pipelines, refineries, and oil fields. And you can, you know, make the case that they're, you know, this a religion that hates that religion, wants to kill that religion, wants to behead this and behead that. But it's another oil war. Just like Kuwait was an oil war, just like Cheney, Iraq was an oil war, Halliburton, Cheney, Iraq was an oil war, this is now going to be another oil war. Get used to it. Okay. Uh, John Mohammed. It's another oil war. You know, I have uh, four children, and I am really afraid for them growing up in a world and in a country that is as scary as this one. The future does not bode well for succeeding generations. When you begin to look at and uncover information that suggests that there is a very evil and diabolical force that sits at the top of this society. And the scariest thing about it is that because we live in a democracy, we have these watershed events ever so often. Pearl Harbor, JFK, the deception around the Gulf of Tonkin and leading us into Vietnam. And after every one of these events, the American people grow in consciousness because there's a body of knowledge that's produced oh, about money what back. our government the four dollars, and the I elites are capable of. Yeah. So as people grow in consciousness, the question is, when will our consciousness catch up to those who are in power? Will we get to the point of being empowered to say, this is rotten to the core? And I believe we're reaching that point when you begin to see a lot of military equipment being distributed down to the local level. 
in all of these cities throughout America. They're starting to recognize that the information is, is so um, widely distributed and available. And they're afraid because we're growing in consciousness about who is really running things in this country and just how evil and how deep the rabbit hole goes. And it may not be a few generations from now where, or even less than that, where we find out who was responsible for this heinous act, how it happened, and maybe some people get some courage and come forward and tell us the responsible parties. But I think we're all growing in consciousness, and soon the cover will be pulled off. The last thing I want to say is, for those people who um, like to assert that the religion of Islam is some kind of evil, fanatical religion at its roots, and that there's something inherent in the religion that makes people violent and aggressive and want to attack and terrorize other freedom-loving people around the world. We have to consider the fact that 30 years ago, when Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, when those individuals burst on the scene, they were celebrities in their own right. There was never, ever any talk about their religion being terrorists. The American people had no knowledge about their religion, much less their religion being associated with terrorism. There was never any discussion about that at all. When did the discussion about Islam being a terrorist religion come into the American okay. uh, debate after 9-11? Time. Before then, there was no debate about that at all. Very good. I find it hard to believe there's someone like George Bush, who probably has an IQ in the double digits, <laughs> yeah. could, could mastermind anything like this. Cheney, not Bush. Yeah. Cheney and the rest of his uh, political advisors had the skills to basically demagogue the issue. Where have we seen this before? From the Alien and Sedition Acts to the Red scare in the, in, in the uh, after World War I to McCarthyism. We've seen this story before. <laughs> and the, and uh, from time to time, you know, the country as it is now with ISIS is whipped into a frenzy. And I can, I was concerned at the time just how much, you know, uh, consent for going to war there was out there and was highly suspicious of it from the very, very beginning. Those of us who are old enough to remember Watergate, remember when, you know, one simple, you know, was security guard blew the lid out of that scandal. So I find it hard to believe that, that an operation like that, that that involves thousands of people to carry it out would have all of the collective mouths shut. It's just, it's too, too incredulous to kind of wrap your head against it. And, and that's all I got to say. Well, we're not like the people that come here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can't keep these guys quiet. Price the date. Okay. Tim thinks it was for the buildings. <laughs> save money on buildings. Good. What do you mean, save money on buildings, Charlie? Demolition. Well, isn't that what 9 11 was all about? Saving money on building demolition contracts? <laughs> A few people came out of the thing. 
Did you not see the flying saucers that were by the uh, airplanes too, as well, uh, from from Roswell and the uh, other things? Whoa. Listen, I want to thank Andy tonight for a good speech. I want to thank him for coming out in front of this crowd tonight and speaking. But Andy, I'm going to go put my uh, Toastmasters hat on now. And you did give a good speech. It was cohesive. But you should have included a little more um, reference material in the body of the speech itself. Much like a good paper comes through, you know, you, you back up your assertions with the claims. Now, I know you gave a lot of references in the speech. Um, I think you, you, I know you know your topic very well. Um, I have started looking at some of the stuff you've passed on to me earlier, and it is, I'm quite frightened to say, convincing, but I'm not convinced. But, to make a long story short, thank you for coming up tonight. Um, I wish you could be a little bit more clear and coherent on the references, and just maybe try to convince us more in like a scholarly manner. And... Hope sometime you'll come to one of my Toastmasters meetings. We've got a lot of good clubs out in Palatine. Thanks. What do they know about 9 11? Nothing that they can certainly in a good speech. Suburbanites? When I was a kid, back in the 50s. 1850s? A while ago, and uh, I found out during the McCarthy period that we had concentration camps already designed for the uh, uh, for the subversives and uh, liberal politicians, uh, Democrats, and so on were quite uh, willing uh, to uh, be seen as responsible uh, for good order in this country uh, so that uh, we would have a way of dealing with those people who might dissent uh, from uh, whatever our government decided to do. Uh, and the government decided no on how to deal with such people. It, th this isn't something that was invented by uh, George Herbert Walker Bush or uh, his son. Uh, there, it, this was what our establishment uh, had ready. Uh, the British had had to deal with fifth columnists, uh, pacifists, and people uh, of dissent uh, in World Wars I and II, uh, and uh, they knew how to deal with them, and so did our government. I'm afraid that our establishment is always somewhat removed from the uh, people and that they don't govern in the interest of the people because there is always a class war and it goes on every day in all sorts of ways and I still don't have to believe in particular, uh, uh, conspiracy theories uh, that uh, you know, that may be generated by this uh, evident uh, lack of faith uh, between the governing authorities and the media and uh, us, <laughs> ordinary folks. Uh, yeah, the question of the, the when, when you have assertions that are made on the basis that the facts 
are evident when they're not that evident. You have to question whether the assertions are uh, substantial and uh, the veracity of them. Yeah, and I uh, therefore don't go along with uh, Andy's uh, propositions. I can't uh, categorically uh, deny them, but you know, while the the beams that held up the World Trade Center uh, may not have been dustified, all of them, uh, you know, the rivets that held those beams in place may have been weakened by. Uh, the, the fuel of the uh, planes that crashed into them, and their the conspiracies of, uh, there are a lot of people in this world uh, who resent the United States and its allies. There are allies of the United States all over the Middle East because we have very significant interests there, and governments are guided by interest. for the last few minutes? I think we're going to Got one more? Okay. Uh, if there are no more rebutters, <laughs> uh, Mr. Foley uh, has the no We will hear from. I'm not allowed to talk and yet. And okay, we're going to hear from Andy. Uh, I'm oh, still in shock. Well, I'm still in shock. Yeah. I know, I did. I, wanted to add, yeah, I just wanted to add something that I forgot to say. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Uh, all right, I was just going to say that early in the 90s, and this is when I was living in New York, if any of you remember, there was a plane, an uh, airliner that, was, that went down in the Atlantic shortly after takeoff. And it was a big, long investigation that found some gas fume in the pipe, in the gas line, whatever, and yes. it, that's how the plane exploded. Well, I was in, uh, in uh, New York at that time, and the day of that happened, and within that day afterwards, there were dozens and dozens of eyewitnesses that said they saw a street going up shortly before that plane went down, which would very clearly indicate some kind of surface to air missile, and that was completely squashed. That was on Long Island. But, yes, TWF, Long, right? Long Island, yes, right. TWF, I believe. That's completely flight quashed. 800. Flight 800. Flight 800, right. Completely quashed. And then years later, two years later, the official report said that it was a spark. It was sure. completely bogus. None of those eyewitness reports had, uh, made it into the final report. So the fact that our government does cover up, it's very obvious to me, and I think most reasonable people. But the problem is we really are powerless, really, to change things, because even those who have the knowledge, you really can't go. You say you can't fight City Hall. Well, the U.S. Capitol and legislator and executive, that's a lot more than City Hall. That's like a thousand City Halls. So it's really tough. I mean, it's, it's depressing. It really is. Okay, Andy, you're on. People want to take on the government. Good work. Yeah, the federal employees are all on the table. Oh, at a time, please, Bill. Yeah. I used to think that the Bush administration was too stupid to, to pull this off, but I can see that Cheney and Roosevelt being smart enough, and I've heard that Bush's IQ would go up about 50 points in private. I'm still collecting emails, and I kind of thought there would be about 20 or 30,000 people killed when those buildings went down, and all it came out about 3,000. Must have been some kind of uh, inside job. Okay. Oh. Brom, right, so we can give Andy's comments. Okay, Andy, your final comments, please. All right. It's a new theory. New conspiracy. Okay. Um, Not enough died. My final comment, I'm going to give you a 30 second demonstration here. This is a what's called a small inverter. There's some pen light batteries, rechargeables on here. <clears throat> it changes 12 volts into 110 volts. These things have gotten vastly cheaper, like cheap cell phones, laptop computers, over the last 10, 15 years. These converters, they're called inverters, they change <clears throat> battery power from solar panels into 110 volt electricity. 
And I want to give you a demonstration here. This is a normal light bulb. This uses 11 watts of electricity, right? That's a conventional light bulb. Here's one of the new LEDs. Look at the difference. That's 10 watts. This is actually 9 watts. That's 9 watts. That's 11 watts. <clears throat> That's a 25 watt bulb here. That's 25 watts. That's 9. And this one over here, this is a flat, uh, warm white LED. That's also about 9.5 watts compared to the 11 watt standard. The reason <clears throat> I show you this demonstration is the LED revolution uh, means that with the new LED lights that last years, you can cut electric consumption 80 to 90 percent for light. You can cut electric consumption 75 to 80 percent with a new refrigerator that replaces a 20 year old. Houses are being built out in Schaumburg, Aurora, all the way to the Wisconsin border in the western suburbs have no furnace, heat for 10 bucks a month. This kind of technology <clears throat> is changing the energy forecasts of how much energy America needs, how much you need to get the job done. And solar panels have come down to the point where they are cost effective uh, with fossil fuels. Actually, solar and wind power is cheaper now. Married with this kind of technology I just showed you, the new cheap solar panels that are going up in Germany and everywhere else will produce energy cheaper than any kind of foreign oil our troops are depending, defending all over the world. So I forget who, who said 9-11 uh, was all about oil. 9-11 <clears throat> was yeah. created to, us to keep right us supporting a military that supports the billionaire predators from the oil companies all over the world. They want to keep us dependent on oil. Harvey Wasserman refers to them as King Kong. That's coal, oil, nukes, and gas. King Kong is a multi-trillion dollar, like, um, what was it, Matt Tiavi from the Rolling Stones said, it's just like a giant vampire squid with its tentacles wrapped around the earth. And these people aren't going to go quietly. They're going to have to be removed from power one way or the other, and uh, otherwise our kids have no future in this country and many other countries too. Uh, Sheila Samples wrote a poem, uh, she quoted a poem in one of her articles from 2005, but it's just short. It says, because in life there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when we must rise and take a stand or leave our butt prints in the sand. It's called Butt Prints in the Sand from 2005. There's hundreds of really good writers that have been writing about the disaster of what's happened to our country since 9-11. Take a minute here real quick. 9-11, as you mentioned, somebody did, uh, related to Pearl Harbor and the others, 9-11 is what's called a false flag operation. It's when you kill some of your own citizens and blame it on the country that you want to invade. And, and, and you know, they got away with not killing any American citizen in the Gulf of Tonkin. They just uh, had our ships firing bullets out there into the dark. And they said, oh, well, we were attacked. Now we've got to you know, uh, ramp up the you know, troops in Vietnam. But 9-11, uh, they recognized that <clears throat> they couldn't just have one of our ships fired upon by some crazed Muslims. If only two or three or four people were killed, that wouldn't motivate the Congress to uh, authorize a wholesale invasion of the seven countries. Their, their plan was seven countries in five years. And it's, it's dragged down a little bit longer. Uh, you talk about facts. Uh, if you study, you study the, there's a book called Steel. I forget who wrote it. It was written about the, the brothers, uh, the father and brothers, the company that actually had the construction company in New York that built the towers. And that book was published a year after 9-11. And it didn't talk about the destruction of the towers. It was just a, like a memorial celebration, but it had pictures in there. And how the, the towers were built to withstand multiple hits from off-course jumbo jets that might be lost in a fog. They foresaw that. 
<clears throat> so the outer perimeter of the towers had heavy girders, and so if a plane hit, it would be like going through a cheese shredder. And then the, the aluminum confetti would be like a mass of confetti hitting a, a massive 40-foot diameter steel telephone pole. Picture throwing a beer can through a cheese shredder and the confetti hitting a telephone pole. It have no effect on it. That's how the towers were built. That's a fact. That's not Andy's opinion or anything else. It comes from the history books. No steel, here's a fact also. No, no steel high-rise building of any kind anywhere in the world has ever been brought down by fire, ever. The three buildings in New York are the only three buildings designated by any country anywhere that were, the citizens were told fires melted the steel and the buildings collapsed. The Twin Towers, all, all three of those buildings uh, incidentally came down at free fall speed. If something is falling through the air as fast as free fall, like dropping a billiard ball off the side of the building, then you know that it's not hitting any structure as things are falling down through the building. These are basic facts of physics, you know, chemistry, thermodynamics. Um, somebody, um, well, the legend of Osama bin Laden is simply that. It's a legend, of, it's a myth. Osama was a real person, but all of his activities after December 2001, after he was buried in the Middle East, all of his activity right up until the time that the myth was created that our heroic Navy SEALs went over there and got him and they killed him and he dumped his body overboard, you know, dumped his body overboard out at sea. The people on the ship that they mentioned that were supposed to have taken his body, those sailors have sent a bunch of emails to their families and everything else. They said, we never saw or heard of any activity on the ship where Osama was supposed to have been drunk, dumped overboard. That's because the people in Afghanistan, the eyewitnesses were his compound, Pakistan, sorry, they reported, they said, you know, Osama wasn't living there. That's some other family. And the, the SEAL team that conducted the raid, successful raid that was supposed to have captured Osama, that SEAL team that helped President Bush get reelected, got his poll numbers back up. Now he's a war hero. He got Osama bin Laden when Bush didn't. That SEAL team was all loaded onto one old Vietnam era helicopter and sent on a mission in Afghanistan where the helicopter was shot down. The whole team died. So <laughs> these are recorded facts. These aren't Andy's opinion. You can look them up in. Uh, as I, I said, I, I didn't list every book up here. You, I, I thought people could look afterwards or do their own research to see um, when I'm talking about facts that are produced by physicists. Incidentally, uh, her book, Professor Judy's book, her philosophy is if you don't know what happened to something, study the evidence. Keep studying the evidence and it will tell you what happened. You know, the, the truth, and Sheila Sample says, the truth isn't everything, is never anything but the truth. It just takes you a while to find it with investigating. That's why we call this forensic science investigations. You investigate the actual science, and it's peer-reviewed by other people. You can repeat the, produce the results in a lab, so it's not just somebody's opinion that can't ever be reproduced. I agree with uh, the fellow that said the future is scary for our children. Yes, it is. Amer America is a year or two or three away from entering a very, very dark time. If all of the adults that are alive now that understand what's going on, if we don't help educate America in a mass and do something about this. Somebody complained that it sounded like my talk was slightly anti-Bush. <laughs> well, um, that would be you know, like accusing some people from certain religions, uh, the Jewish faith perhaps, about being critical of Hitler. Um, Hitler didn't do a whole lot of good things for the Jewish people. Uh, I think that needs to be said. And uh, George Bush didn't do a whole lot of good things for the American people. Jim Hightower published a book, Thieves in High Places, in 2003. They listed the first two years of all the bills that were passed by the Bush-Cheney administration. And he said, look at this toxic waste. <clears throat> look in this hundreds of bills. See if you can find anything in that list that isn't the essence of Antichrist. 
one, one religious station was actually running a contest one day. I forget. It was back in about 2004. They said, we got blank checks here, $200. Call in and give us a bill, a piece of legislation of anything the Bush administration has done that helped the American people. Basically, find anything that's not the essence of Antichrist. Anything that Jesus might have supported, you will mail you a check for $200. Ran the contest all day long. They, they didn't have, they had no takers. And, and Jim Hightower said, look at this list, and then ask yourself, uh, you know, why, why do you think there's so many sex scandals in the Republican Party? You don't do your service, do your, your case uh, service by comparing anyone to Hitler. Let no, let I'm, I'm let using that as an example. That's a bad example. Let him speak. I would suggest you move yourself a little bit faster up the Galileo learning curve on this body of evidence. <laughs> And that way, uh, you'll you'll be a little bit easier, uh, you know, more understanding of stuff. Incidentally, uh, in comparison, the American the American military industrial complex, in terms of a global killing machine, is vastly bigger than anything Hitler dreamed about in his wildest dreams. Hitler didn't have the budget we do. So I, I would suggest you study the actual evidence I rather than study the evidence. criticize me. I, I hold to what I said. Uh, could I enter one thing here? We're going through global warming. That might mean the end of this planet. And that is far worse than Hitler. That's why we need thorium reactors. Well, that's a good comment. Yeah, we, uh, hopefully we'll schedule a talk someday in the near future about Naomi Klein's new book out that talks about climate change, where we are, and what could be done with the trillion dollars a year or more than that. We, we could free up several trillion dollars a year of money that's being wasted right now and move America forward. But as you've seen from the literature and a lot of other places, that we, we, you can't move forward until you address a crime that was committed and solid. Uh, you know, we have to, as long as we live in the bubble of mythology and keep having memorials in the schools every year about 9-11, we're not going to make any progress toward making the future better for our kids. Future will get better when we face reality and say we have to do something different. Okay? Thank you all for coming and uh, we'll see you again someday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.